Hi everybody, uh, we're going to make a start. Um, I'm Anne Matthews, the chairperson of the Irish Forum for Global Health and I work in DCU as well in the School of Nursing and Human Sciences. So you're really welcome back to day two of our conference. Most of you were here yesterday so I don't need to give the overview but just some of the highlights from yesterday. Uh, we had some fantastic uh, sessions, we had great plenary sessions, soapbox, uh, snapshots, other kinds of presentations and of course as usual lots of great discussion and new connections and then really the highlight at the end of the day was Maureen O'Sullivan uh, TD launching our Irish Forum for Global Health Strategy with a really rousing and inspiring uh, speech so thank you to those who were there here yesterday. Uh, you're very welcome here today if you've just joined us. Um, just to say some of the activities that are going on today, you have the programme. Uh, just to remind people that the Global Health Rights Team, led by Ian, who, who many people know, will be maybe asking you for your impressions of the conference, asking you for a photograph, especially with some of the Sustainable Development Goal uh, graphics. Uh, if, you, if you feel drawn towards one, uh, we'll, we'll take your photograph with that. So. Um, please seek them out or they'll seek you out. The volunteers who uh, we're thrilled to have with us again today mostly have a green uh, notice around their, around their necks, so they'll, they'll chat to you. If you need anything, you can ask any of us involved or, or the volunteers. Um, the Global Health Breakfast for Students and Young Professionals concluded a short time ago. It was phenomenal. Um, it uh, involved, you know, drawing on the expertise of the group and you know looking for ways to, to to build on that and the student competition as well and we'll hear more about that later. The last thing to say is at lunchtime, this is a, a plug, um, we are holding a, a discussion group for all men and women interested in women in global health. There's a movement, a growing movement around the world acknowledging what's on this slide, so I'm, I'm use, abusing my position here, which shows that most of the health workforce are females, especially in, so, in an area like long-term care. When we move up further, the higher up we go in the kind of organizational structures, ministries, uh, heads of organizations, right up to heads of, of health-related corporations, uh, women seem to disappear, uh, we know that. So uh, we're interested in discussing this in Ireland, how, how we'd like to move forward uh, with, within that Women in Global Health um, umbrella movement. So we, I'll be hosting a discussion at lunchtime, quarter past one, so it's a small chance to have something to eat, and then we can move up to tutorial room eight, but you'll see that on the program. So now I just want to open up today's uh, conference um, and say that we're delighted to have um, some excellent speakers and chairpersons. Our chairpersons today are Sam Taylor, the Director of Médecins Sans Frontiers, and Fiona Gannon, Director of Programmes from Goal. So they'll be keeping everything moving. Um, you'll see from the programme that we have Mike Clark, Olive Moore, and David Wittick uh, with us. Mike is joining us um, from afar, and uh, he, he'll explain more about that. So <laughs> I'll hand over to Sam and Fiona for the morning, and I wish you a good day with us in the conference. Uh, good morning. Um, our speakers this morning are Olive Moore, who is Head of Programmes with Trocra, um, and uh, she's uh, speaking to us today about Trocra's approach to learning. Olive is Head of Programmes with Trocra, uh, the Irish Catholic Development and Humanitarian Agency. She has over two decades of experience working in international development, including civil society, government and international multilateral organizations as a practitioner and a manager. Prior to this, she worked in the World Bank with the Global Partnership for Social Accountability in Washington, D.C. She also worked with Amnesty International and the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Olive has traveled extensively and spent two years living and working in East Africa. She has a degree in political science and a European Master's in Human Rights and Democratization. Um, we're also joined by video um, with, by Dr. Michael J. Ryan, who's Assistant Director General of Emergency Preparedness and Response with WHO. Um, Dr. Ryan has been at the forefront of managing acute risks to global health for over 20 years. He has a track record of leadership and innovation 
in tackling epidemics and other public health emergencies. His background is in medicine, in infectious disease and public health, completing uh, medical training at the National University of Ireland in Galway and his master's in public health at UCD. He undertook then specialist training in public health and infectious diseases at the Health Protection Agency in London with the European Programme for Intervention Epidemiology Training. Uh, joining WHO in 1996, when WHO established a unit uh, to respond to emerging and epidemic disease threats. Um, during his time at WHO, Dr. Ryan has led numerous international outbreak response teams becoming coordinator of WHO's epidemic response team in 2000. He was the conceiver of and a founding member of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, GOARN, that has been utilized in over 150 international outbreak responses. Um, so David Wittig, <laughs> who is here beside us, uh, is uh, currently the CEO of UK Med. Uh, David joined UK Med as a chief executive in January 2018 and has a, a long, um, distinguished career in senior roles in the humanitarian sector, having previously worked as senior advisor in emergency response with WHO, global operations director for Merlin, health director with Goal, director of operations management at Save the Children, and as country director with IMC. So, without much further ado, we're going to hand you over to Dr. Michael J. Ryan, who is joining us from DRC. Good, good morning, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, good, 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 good. Uh, uh, not many people call me Michael J. Many of you who, who know me there will know I go by Mike. <laughs> um, uh, and sorry for not being with you uh, there today uh, at the conference. I'm uh, currently in Congo. We had some problems with the video connection because of uh, a massive thunderstorm here, which I think is actually preventing our broker colleagues landing in Beni. Um, but uh, Beni is in North Kivu, the current uh, epicenter of the outbreak. The um, situation here, frankly, is, is challenging, and it's, uh, it's testing every aspect of our collective response capacities. Uh, Yesterday, we reached the unfortunate number of uh, 300 cases of Ebola, um, and we are operating in the context of a, an, ongo an ongoing humanitarian crisis and, and extreme conflict. Um, at the moment, uh, we're tracking 5,500 contacts uh, every day. We have 91 inpatients in three Ebola treatment units, uh, two provided by our colleagues in MSF, uh, thanks Sam, and uh, one by uh, Alima. Here in Benny, MSF are also uh, in the process of building a, a, a very important and necessary transit centre in Benny, so we can decompress the pressure on the current Adima centre in Benny. Um, we have uh, 133 uh, patients treated with novel um, um, antivirals and anti antibodies uh, under a, a MURI uh, investigational use protocol. We've vaccinated over 24 thousand people in the response thus far with an investigational vaccine, uh, EBOV, um, and uh, continue to, to try to get the job done. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the situation, security situation is difficult and extremely fragile with a large-scale armed conflict with a number of uh, anti-government elements uh, uh, against the, the forces of the, the national government. And in the midst of this, we have a UN peacekeeping operation uh, of the Fourth Intervention Brigade of SADC and uh, MINUSCO, the, the mission for peacekeeping here from the United Nations. Uh, frankly, our communities are, 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 are completely traumatized by the, the ongoing violence over years, by the massacres, uh, the, the kidnappings, the executions, and very often react uh, to that lack of security after incidents with, with street protests and uh, real more or complete shutdown of, of civic work, which has happened now on at least four or five occasions over the last two months and completely disrupt their operations for, for, for days on end. And we have many brave Congolese and international workers in the communities every day, but it's, it, it can be very difficult to maintain operations in, in the environment we face. Um, uh, community engagement in the face of Ebola has been extremely difficult. Uh, 
there's a, a deep lack of trust in government and particularly in the government health system and more faith in the traditional and private health networks. The system most preferred by communities here is the tradi modern approach, which is a, essentially a mix of traditional and mainstream medical practices. In Beni alone, healthcare structures and facilities that, that are not uh, government based and that are essentially run by this uh, tradi modern private network. Uh, the problem with this is that this system has become deeply implicated in both disease transmission and in significant delays in detecting and isolating suspected cases of uh, Ebola virus uh, disease. Um, um, we, um, the situation really declare, uh, demonstrates true complexity of epidemic containment in, a, in this unstable security environment. And, delivering effective risk communication, surveillance, laboratory services, vaccination, case management operations in this context is, is difficult, but we are getting the job done. We have successfully contained the disease in, in Mangina, Mabalako, in Makeke, in, in Wicha and Kamanda, which are, are red zones in terms of security, and in Chomia. Um, we maintain preparedness operations and rapid response teams in, in, in Bunya and in Goma. Uh, and currently the epicenter of the outbreak is here in Beni, with uh, significant transmission of disease in Batembo, which is to the south of Beni, and in the areas in between here and Batembo to the south, which is uh, in the main Mai Mai uh, controlled area. The Allied Democrats, the ADF uh, rebels operate to the northwest of Beni and engage in, in, in systematic attacks on the town and FARDC. The Mai Mai uh, operate to the, the east and south, um, and uh, control much of the territory uh, in which we now have significant transmission. A, a good example is the village of Kanyahunya in Kalanguta, just to the south here of Beni. Uh, we've had uh, a large number of deaths in a single village uh, with further transmission in that village. This is a Mai Mai controlled uh, village, an extremely difficult access and uh, a very, very sensitive process of engagement with that community in order to assure access. We do have access now, and they're tracking contacts and uh, vaccinating people as we speak. Um, we're relying heavily on partners uh, from uh, the NGO and international community, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, including UNICEF, MSF, and the Red Cross to, to support a government-led response. And to recognise, and this is the government are leading the response and, and have provided some excellent leadership in, in doing this. Uh, the Director General for Health, Dr. Bate, has been here in the field with us since the very beginning and spent three months leading from the front. We have many other NGOs, uh, IC, Save the Children, Oxfam, Caritas, Mercy Corps, Medair, uh, and others uh, working with us, uh, mainly in community engagement, in, in, in infection prevention and control, and in, in and health structure and in feeding programs supporting um, uh, Oxfam and others supporting feeding programs for, for victims and contacts uh, the, under the leadership of uh, the World Food. Um, um, I suppose this is the line, the front line of global health security. Um, and a number of risks have converged here to drive amplify a dangerous outbreak uh, in a vulnerable, vulnerable population, and which now threatens. Uh, the rest of Congo and, and, and the region uh, and beyond. Uh, this is a zone of high uh, significant biodiversity. It's a zone of high population density, exploitation of the forest for economic purposes, a huge amount of conflict, huge population mobility for security and economic reasons, an ongoing humanitarian crisis, disrupted development, and a profound weakness of the health system. So, I suppose for your conference today, the, the question uh, in an extreme situation like this is, you know, can we really talk about the, the, the title of the, of the session, Effective Partnership and Strategies that Bridge the Humanitarian Development Nexus? Uh, well, I think we can, and, and, and frankly, I, I think we must. Uh, this epidemic is not driven by a virus. It's driven by human behavior, uh, human systems, the disrupted development cycle, uh, the lack of essential service, services such as health. Um, we all, and those of you at the conference, uh, have drank the Kool-Aid, but the world and many others need to wake up and realize that the, the best form of epidemic prevention and mitigation is a health system that can deliver essential health education and services to its population, linked to an effective public health service capable of detecting and responding uh, to epidemics quickly. 
Our analysis in the emergencies program is that over 60% of preventable mortality targeted in the SDGs is located in 30 fragile, conflict-affected and vulnerable countries. And 80% of significant epidemics are occurring in these same countries. Uh, we don't get to the SDGs or to global health security without a significant investment in health systems in these countries. I think this necessitates a deep partnership between the humanitarian and development communities. These aren't separate issues, uh, but intimate, intimately linked, especially when it comes to epidemic preparedness and response. Uh, health systems and health emergencies, as Dr. Tedra said many times, are two sides of the same coin. So um, many thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you all. I hope I've come across uh, clearly. I'm, I actually hope uh, <laughs> I better, uh, to be home in Ireland very soon uh, for uh, a few days or an hour with my family in Galway and uh, I'll hopefully be raising a pint in, in Nocton's uh, sooner, than I, sooner than I think. So thank you all and I'd be very happy to uh, take any questions. Over. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we're opening the floor for any questions that you might have there. Um, yep, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael. I just wondered, in terms of the experience in the Ebola crisis in West Africa uh, and the strengthening there of community surveillance uh, networks and how that really helped to contain the epidemic, is there any chance of applying the same approach there, given that it's a conflict situation? Uh, that's a, actually an excellent question. Um, absolutely. And in fact, I would argue that in, the more conflict and the more disruptive the systems is, the more you have to rely on community resilience, community engagement, and community-based surveillance. Uh, community here are really beginning to understand uh, what Ebola is, uh, and they have the solutions. We're just here to provide them with the support to prevent uh, disease transmission. So you're absolutely correct. Community-based surveillance in these situations, and not just surveillance, it's an engagement and a partnership with that community. It's exactly the same when it comes to the healthcare facilities. Uh, there's a demand for service from those facilities, and the communities can change the behavior of those facilities way better than we can by their demands and their engagement with the facilities that serve them. So a community-based approach, uh, in my experience, is the only way you get rid of Ebola. Uh, yes, the vaccines help, the surveillance helps, the drugs help, but uh, without an engaged and participating community who, who own the problem and own the solution, uh, we'll always struggle in situations like this. Over. Thank you, Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, Margaret Fitzgerald here. Good to see you again, even though we don't really see you. Uh, good to hear the voice. Um, I'm just wondering about WHO, whether you intend to uh, go to a higher stage of uh, action and international liaison. As you know, we receive a high number of uh, people from DRC uh, looking for asylum, and uh, there are no uh, particular measures at the moment uh, to prepare for these. Thank you. I think that question might be for someone else, Margaret, but uh, good to hear your voice as well, Margaret. Uh, we might have a drink in Lewisburg soon. No, but that, Margaret, that was, that was directed at Mike, that question, no? Um, it's sorry, Mike, just to elaborate whether WHO intend to issue any further, uh, you know, what's the trigger point to have a heightened uh, international... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I thought you were talking about uh, refugee and asylum issues, Margaret. Sorry. Yes. No, the emergency committee of the IHR has met once uh, and has considered the uh, epidemic. Uh, I think it stopped maybe one inch short of declaring a, a public health emergency of international concern. Um, clearly, the surrounding countries have high levels of preparedness. I think we've screened now over 15 million people at the borders around Congo, particularly the borders to Congo, Sudan, and Rwanda. So there's a very intense process. Uh, governments of the surrounding countries have approved the use of investigational vaccine and healthcare workers. And as I speak, I hope 
that's beginning to roll out, especially in Uganda for frontline health workers uh, near the border, so we don't end up with uh, the kind of nosocomial transmission we would have had here. Um, in terms of travel advisories, we, we don't advise a restriction of travel into Congo. I mean, the, this outbreak is limited to a very, very tiny footprint within the country. Uh, there, there is significant population movement, but the direct risk is to those countries that directly abut the northeastern part of Congo. I, I don't believe there's any particular uh, risk in, in Europe or elsewhere, uh, other than the normal uh, vigilance uh, that will be necessary at, uh, at airports and with physicians and others. Someone returning from Congo with a fever is much more likely to have malaria. Uh, so, therefore, you know, being alert is always good, but I, I don't believe at this point we need specific uh, restrictions or specific measures in relation to international travel uh, to or from the Congo. Over. Thank you, Mike. Are there any more uh, questions from the floor yet? Hi, Mike. My name is Hattie from Goal. Um, it's very exciting to hear someone from the front line, as opposed to us all sitting here in the room looking terribly smart. Um, I was just wondering, so uh, what countries like Uganda have relatively frequent outbreaks of um, Ebola, but they're very, very quickly quashed and contained. Um, so I was just wondering what is done differently in those countries that are exposed to it frequently and are able to 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 deal with the situation quickly. What's actually what, what what's the difference between the two contexts or contexts that aren't able to deal with this and subsequently we, we end up with with an emergency response and a considerable outbreak? Yeah, thanks, Eddie. A very good question. There, uh, like all systems, uh, I think human human nature is we only learn through crisis and disaster. And much of the reason why Uganda has a, has a pretty efficient mechanism for responding to epidemics like Ebola is related to, you know, about outbreaks like the, uh, the terrible outbreak of Ebola in northern, in, uh, in, in Gulu in, in 2000, which I was in, involved with myself as field coordinator. And those kind of shocks to the system, I think, wake everybody up to the reality. And in that time, since Congo has implemented, you know, systematic field epidemiology training, it's done a lot of work on um, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, viral research institute and its capacity to rapidly diagnose uh, disease. It has established rapid response teams at Ministry of Health level who can immediately go to the field and have the necessary resources. It, it's still a challenge in the context of any developing country, but you can see that the, the basics are, are, are there. The, the other uh, thing in the likes of Uganda is uh, you know, with the experience with HIV and other diseases, uh, the community engagement and community-based approaches to healthcare delivery are much more developed. Uh, there is more faith in the government system, so therefore outbreaks do tend to get detected more quickly, uh, and communities tend to engage and, and, and respond and comply with public health measures more readily. It's, that's a huge generalization, but uh, I certainly wouldn't... Uh, uh, like to see this disease, for example, getting into somewhere like South Sudan. I know Sinead Walters are our new ambassador in South Sudan. I've had messages from her uh, with expressing her concerns on preparedness there. So it really comes down to the, I think, the previous experience of the country. Uh, it comes down to, the, I mean, people always ask me, what's the best form of epidemic preparedness and response? And I very often say three things. One, governance, two, governance, and three, governance. Um, and uh, I think it really comes down to what, what, what does the government see this as an important issue? Does the government uh, put in place the necessary investments to build the basic health and public health system? But yes, you're right. Uh, Uganda has a pretty impressive uh, record of response. But we have been working with Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Congo, um, or, uh, Uganda, and South Sudan very intensively. And we've had teams in those countries for the last number of months now working with them on, on preparedness measures. So I, I hope we don't ever reach the, the, hor the horror that was uh, West Africa. We've had time, we've had lead time, the countries have had time to prepare, and, and I hope to God that uh, if, God forbid, the disease does reach any of those countries, uh, we, we will be able to uh, snuff it out quickly. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I suggest um, we, we thank Mike for his participation, taking the time to talk to us today and, and move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone here, Mike.
Thank you. So our next speaker now is going to be David um, Whitewick from, from UK Med, the former, and then followed by Olive um, from Olive Moore, the head of programs from Trocra. We'll do the two presentations back to back and then leave questions, hopefully a good 15, 20 minutes of questions um, for everybody at the end, if that's okay. So I, I'll hand over now to David, who's got a presentation to give us here. presentation I, I was entertaining the possibility that there might be some people in the room who hadn't heard of UK Med. <laughs> um, I suspect that that probably holds true. So uh, just just so everybody is is aware So, uh, very quickly, the, the advert won't last more than about 35 seconds. UK Meds, a small NGO, we're based in the UK in Manchester University. Uh, we're you are the on only participant in the conference. And outbreak response. And we, we identify, recruit, and train medics largely out of the NHS for deployments overseas, either with the UK emergency medical team or with uh, other NGOs or through the UN system. So we did have someone out with Mike's team in DRC earlier this year. Um, right. How did my movement see? Sorry. Oh, okay, cool, got it, right. Sorry, I'm technically challenged. Um, <laughs> Used to be a used to be a really simple world. Um, certainly, when when I entered this sphere in about twenty odd years ago, um, we just thought in terms of a continuum. That was what relief to development was. Was supposed to be a nice continuum, and it followed this kind of model of there would be some sort of shock, there'd be a period of emergency response, there'd be a period of recovery, and then everyone would slip back into development again, and it would all be fine. That was the thinking. Um, of course. The reality was uh, a little bit different to that. Um, and what we, what we found repeatedly, and this is probably a familiar picture to most of the people in the room who have worked in a DRC or a South Sudan or a Somalia or, or any such place, um, you start off with a shock, perhaps. The period of emergency response is greatly elongated because there are a huge number of emergencies to deal with. And then you get into a system where essentially you are delivering basic services in substitution for government. And that would describe the situation in a great many fragile states, where essentially there's a large body of UN and NGOs who are all essentially substituting for government and dealing with spikes and crises along the way. So every so often there will be some kind of crisis or emergency shock, such as <coughs> Ebola in DRC. Um, but it's one shock within a far greater uh, context of fragility and, and conflict. And we never actually really reach a position where the entire country is engaged in development, although development and development activities are indeed possible within a fragile situation. So it's much more complicated. And that, I suspect, is what led to the use of the word nexus. Um, which is slightly frustrating, I imagine, because uh, it does seem to overcomplicate things uh, conceptually, but essentially we're dealing with a situation in which for a large number of states we have to respond to emergencies, we have to deliver long-term services in substitution for government, and we have to look at system strengthening and development activities all at the same time. That's basically what it comes to. Um, some arguments against this and these are the sort of, you know, the, 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 basic, the basic quibbles around this kind of nexus and coherence has been, if we're combining development and humanitarian action at the same time, will we subsume humanitarian action? Will we erode humanitarian principles? Will humanitarian action become part of a wider political agenda and state building? Very valid question, hasn't been answered, but the question has been out there for a good 15, 20 years now. Um, how do we ensure that responses plan for the long term right from the start of an emergency response? People are engaged in dealing with an emergency response. How can they plan for the long term? 
Um, how do we coordinate effectively between all of the different multiplicity of actors and agendas? Um, and how do we identify ways to build to the longer term? So all of those issues come up. Um, and going down, going down through all of these, the, the sort of tendency for people to feel very overwhelmed by the multiplicity of agendas and different instruments and different formats and different proposal types. I think for any of us that have worked in any of the sort of fragile states, you find that just wading through the sheer bulk of donor requirements and different agencies' agendas, it just becomes overwhelming. And in the end, people just sort of shelve it and carry on with whatever they were doing. Um, even within the same organization, it is often difficult for people on two sides of the relief, on either side of the relief and development coin, to have a coherent conversation. Often people will approach um, quite sort of rational conversations from a point of view of conflict. Ultimately, it comes down to sort of personality types and whether one, one is uh, a believer in principle trumps all or the process is all important. If you are on either side of an extreme development and relief argument, you will have an ethical framework in which you are either obsessed about the principle or you are obsessed about the process and if you don't have a perfect process, you will not have a perfect outcome. And those two personality types are at the sort of root of this conflict, even within organisations. You see it time and again. Obviously, I'm overstating it, but you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with those kinds of arguments. Within this, we now have EMTs. For those of you that are unfamiliar with EMTs, emergency medical teams. A few years ago, they used to be foreign medical teams, but they've been renamed emergency medical this is something that grew out of the Haiti response. So for those that may be familiar with Haiti, I won't go into all of the statistics, but far too many inappropriate surgical interventions, uh, far too many inappropriate uh, medical actors without standards. So it's particularly looking at medical responses. Um, and there is now an entire EMT system housed within an EMT secretariat in WHO, so within Mike's team. Uh, we have Ian Norton and team who, who run an EMT secretariat and they set standards in something called the Blue Book which set out exactly how we should all operate and how we should act. And EMTs are there to provide surgical care through field hospitals, outbreak response and indeed a whole load of other medical related services. Um, EMTs are not perhaps long-term thinkers. I think it has to be admitted. Um, and they are frequently characterized by very time-limited deployments. So for example, OSMAT, which is the Australian EMT, only deployed for two weeks at a time. That's it. They're in and out. Um, this is the kind of thing that they are focused on. That's what they're interested in. That's what they're thinking about. Um, and it's very, very short-term, fast, 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 go in, get things done, do it properly. That is the, that's the, the thinking, the culture. Um, so people are concentrating on exit strategies rather than any kind of long-term engagement with systems and coordination and how do we build back better and, and how do we ensure that this perhaps doesn't happen again in the future. And they're often government entities. Some are not, but many are. So of the emergency medical teams that are verified have the WHO kite mark. I think there are about 13 or something at the moment. Uh, so not terribly many. Most of them are government entities. And they're derived from either military, civil protection, fire service, and a combination of whatever government medical service happens to be in place in that country. And they're brought together and they're deployed out for a very short period of time they do their job, they come back for tea and medals, and, and that's it. Literally. Everyone got a medal from Ebola. Um, which is very nice. It's got nice. Thank you, Buzz Bank. Um, sorry? <laughs> um, so sometimes there is this, there's this real challenge of culture about how they engage with the 
the wider context? How do they coordinate with NGOs who have a very different culture and philosophical background? Um, and how do they engage with governments? They're quite happy to engage with governments. They're quite happy to be coordinated by the UN system. But they're very unaware about the kind of debates that we have in this sort of forum. Um, there certainly needs to be a far greater engagement and coordination on the part of EMTs. I, I don't think there's any question. EMTs understand that. They're just not clear how to do it. Um, they don't really see themselves as part of the humanitarian system. They are and they're not. Um, there needs to be some kind of erosion of the, the barriers between them and the rest of the NGOs. They're never going to really be NGOs, but they can be a useful supplement and they can be directed to engage with the arguments and the debates in a coherent way. They can be and they're probably willing to engage with that. Um, and they should be looking at how they engage relationships within the context that they're likely to have to deploy to. And some of them do. Some of them do. So particularly with capacity building and preparedness. So many EMTs, um, us for example, uh, we don't deploy that often. We deploy at the behest of DFID when we are deploying as the UK EMT. When we deploy as UK mode, we can do what we want. Um, but when we're deploying as the UK EMT, um, it's comparatively rare, once a year. Once a year. This year it was Bangladesh for diphtheria. Uh, there might be another one towards the end of the year, we'll see. DRC may, may get worse. Um, but in between times, there's a lot of engagement with capacity building and preparedness for us. And this is something I think many of the other EMTs need to engage with, to make sure that we have some kind of relationship with the governments and the countries and the NGOs that we might deploy alongside or within. Um, and to make sure that the people that we are deploying, and let's not forget that many of the people that we deploy are doctors and nurses and other medics from the National Health Service. Um, they, many of them have not travelled extensively, most of them have not worked in NGOs before, and there's a lot of training and preparation in order to get those people attuned to the kind of context and the people they will be dealing with and have to negotiate with. Um, and the more that that happens, obviously, the better and the more tuned EMTs will get. But I think there is, no, there is no, doubt, no doubt that EMTs are here to stay. I think that is probably not in question. They're a very useful policy tool for governments, and governments quite like them. Um, they are a driver of standards. I think there's no real question about that. Whether those standards can be sustained or paid for across the entire sector is a whole different question. But they are a driver of standards, and I think that has to be seen as a, in a positive light, and people have to sort of, we have to take that and work with it. Um, and they can be a very useful supplement if engaged with, with them in the right way. <coughs> Perhaps not all of the more full governmental ones, but some of the slightly less quasi-governmental ones can supplement and assist the rest of the sector outside of the, uh, the sort of EMT deployments. So I think there are ways that they should engage much more, and there are ways that the rest of the humanitarian sector can engage them and bring them into this debate, because at the moment they are innocents abroad. Um, and I think being over, overly critical of them will simply put up barriers. And actually what we need to do is, is kind of bring them in and uh, guide them, sit them down, nice cup of tea, this is how it works. Um, right, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Now, we're going to hear from Olive Moore, the Head of Programmes from Trocra. Good morning. So, we've heard from Mike, um, who's in the centre of quite an acute Ebola crisis in North Kivu. Um, and then David talked about the, some of the more traditional humanitarian responses and the need for adaptation and shifting and changing around that. And what I wanted to talk about a bit more was from the other side of the nexus, from the development programming perspective. So I'm not a humanitarian. I've been working within development programming for um, a number of decades now, but increasingly more and more realizing that because of the nexus, that that shift, that I'm engaging a lot more with humanitarian specialists, looking more about humanitarian strategies and engaging in their programmings, and I thought I could share a little bit of that today from the side of the traditional, more traditional development programming. So I'm sure... For you. There we go. 
I'm sure many of you are a little bit more familiar with TROCRA, but even just to, we are a development and humanitarian agency, and TROCRA would be the CARITAS, and CARITAS is the large humanitarian network globally of Catholic agencies within Ireland. Um, our work focuses on resource use and rights, women's empowerment, and humanitarian preparedness and response. And by resource use and rights, we're, we're working a lot on the stuff you might be familiar around sustainable agriculture, around access to markets, around responding to climate change, and also then access to land and ensuring individuals have access to land and have rights to land and water and the resources that they have. And our work on women's empowerment is all about ensuring that women's voices are heard within their communities and within yeah. the politics and political spaces yeah. that they're in and also addressing that, ensuring they live lives free from violence. And aligned to that, we also have all of our humanitarian preparedness and response work in 17 countries across the world. Um, our humanitarian work has been growing significantly over the last decade. We've gone from working perhaps 20% of our funding on humanitarian to up to 42% currently. And the reason for this is because it's really the massively changing context that we're seeing. The fact that we now have more people displaced globally than ever before. Um, the fact that there is a severe funding crisis and funding shortage to respond to this. Last year when the UN launched 30 humanitarian emergency funds, only two of them were up to 50% funded. So we've really seen that there is a massive underfunding of humanitarian globally. Um, and it's a response to the fact that we're seeing within our traditional development programming that much of our work is being undermined by the humanitarian challenges that we're seeing increasingly and by the shocks and stresses. And then also what we alluded, what David alluded to earlier is protracted crises, that it's no longer that idea of a continuum where you have short and quick interventions and then you shift out that actually what we're seeing within humanitarian is these crises go on for far, far longer, up to 15, 20 years in some of the countries we're working in. So I suppose there's a couple, just for the background, a few things for the context of why we're doing joint development humanitarian programming is, I suppose, our theory of change is a start and how we understand that change happens, that as an organization we work with individuals, we also believe in working with communities, working with civil society and working with government and institutions. And increasingly we're seeing that we need to adapt this theory of change across all of our humanitarian work and across our development programming work. The other part of that is that we don't implement directly, we implement through partners. So with, with the exception of our work in Somalia, we work through local civil society NGOs and civil society organizations, church organizations, community organizations, NGOs who do the work. And we work in partnership hand in hand with those groups to do the work. So also this has real implications for us and how we work and again the development humanitarian nexus. Um, we made a really significant decision five or six years ago when we underwent this new strategic plan to move to what we called more integrated programming. And by integrated programming, we were essentially trying to respond to what we see as an excess through development, humanitarian and peace. And because we've shifted towards integrated programming, we've gone through a whole process of in some ways nearly turning ourselves upside down and inside out to try and change all of the processes and systems that we have, to change the staffing systems and structures that we have, um, in some cases to change the partnerships that we have, to relook at all of the strategies and the interventions and how we work in order to be able to work in a more coherent way across humanitarian and development. And this integrated programming is a journey that we're on and has been really, really challenging and that's what I thought I'd share with you some of the things that we're learning around that. And also part of that has been responsiveness to Irish Aid, who's one of our main funders here in Ireland. And Irish Aid also made the decision two years ago to integrate both their development funding program and their humanitarian funding together. Again, a response to this nexus and pushing us to plan together and to report together rather than to have two separate reports and two separate thinking and separate strategies around that. And that's really helped us along the journey. But what I thought I'd talk to particularly is because this is where I think I have most learning to share and it may not necessarily be focused on health but certainly I think some of the learnings that we have out from it are, are still very relevant. Is looking at a couple of countries where, like if you look at Zimbabwe, Kenya, Malawi, also Ethiopia last year, what we saw was slow onset cyclical climate change was impacting very much on our development work. So the work we're doing on resource rights and use, the work we're doing on women's empowerment. It used to be in Malawi that every decade there would be a drought. But what we've seen in the last decade is that pretty much every second year, and now increasingly every year, there is some sort of drought or some sort of floods around climate change. In Zimbabwe, we had the similar experience where we had a Nino, we had drought in 2015 and 2016, followed by floods in 2016 and 2017. 
We've had the drought across all of the countries in East Africa. Again, similar experiences in Kenya, where we're doing development programming work, but more and more and more we're finding that that program is being upset by significant shocks and stresses related to climate change. And what we found was that our development partners didn't have the capacity to respond to this. Because we had pre-planned development programs in place, we didn't have the flexibility, we didn't have the knowledge, we didn't have the skills to meet the humanitarian need or protect the development gains. Because often what you'd have is you would have a development program in place, a shock, a stress would hit, and then communities and families would respond with what we would call negative coping strategies. So for example, they would start to perhaps moving into eating seeds that they had instead of saving seeds for the next harvest. They might start to sell livestock that they had because they had to respond quite quickly in order to get access to money to buy food. And what those negative coping strategies were doing was it was undermining all of the development work that we'd done and basically moving us, shifting us right back to not just where we were before we started, but in an even worse situation than that. And our response to this, again, is, and that's what I thought is a useful thing for us to look at, is the idea of resilience programming, essentially. So what we mean by resilience programming, and this has been a shift for us organizationally, is rather than having a program on women's empowerment or a program on sustainable agriculture and having a goal that this is what you want to achieve, we shifted the goal significantly. And the goal of what we're trying to achieve with the communities that we're working with is that individuals, communities, civil society and institutions are better, better able to prepare for, to withstand and to recover from these shocks and stresses. And what you're doing with resilience programming is you're shifting the focus. And risk management and risk mitigation becomes a really significant focus of your programming. And you then have multiple entry points, multiple intervention strategies, multiple approaches. And it could be a whole range of different things that you're doing. And your focus is not just on disaster, resist, disaster risk, is in humanitarian. Your focus is also environmental risk, natural resource management, economic risk, or also socio-political risk around conflict. And that idea there is where you move into the triple nexus, where we're talking about development, humanitarian, and peace together. <coughs> so your vision is that you're trying to plan and develop programs that respond to both short-term humanitarian needs and longer-term resilience and development needs. You're managing risk as part of the design and delivery of these programs. You're building capacity of some of the traditional partners to plan and implement humanitarian responses. So some of our traditional development partner NGOs are starting to engage in building their capacity around humanitarian responses across a range of different areas. Um, and you're designing and delivering humanitarian responses that can leverage and use the development gains and strategies that you already have in place. And then importantly, you're very actively planning how you're going to transition from development programming into humanitarian programming, back out of humanitarian programming, back into humanitarian programming. And you're doing that in real time so that you're able to respond a lot more proactively. So essentially, you may have a program of nutrition, food security, livelihoods, access to markets, um, particularly also then looking at some of the implications of malnutrition, of disease when we're moving into crisis and drought and flood. Um, there may be some work around gender-based violence and women's empowerment included in it, but then what we're layering to this and what we're learning from the humanitarian section is around hazard mapping, around vulner better vulnerability ana analysis, EPP, emergency preparedness and planning, contingency planning, having early warning systems in place so that we're able to track when we see a shift, when we're looking at weather patterns, when we can preempt when there may be drought or when there may be flood and what we need to do differently in order to respond to that. And then importantly, you're bringing in what are more traditional humanitarian strategies like food for work, food for assets, cash, voucher transfers, and being able to put those. And then of course, the psychosocial well-being and the protection. So I suppose some of the big challenges that we see when we try and do this. So when you're a traditional development NGO and you're trying to engage in humanitarian work, one of the most significant barrier and challenge for us is funding. Um, in Malawi last February or March, when we were we met with all of our partners. Um, I went to visit some of the local work that we're doing on women's groups around women's participation and voice. And I heard very directly from the women immediately themselves, they're saying, yes, this work is interesting, but my children are hungry. My children are hungry, and I'm afraid my children are going to be sick. Now, we knew at that stage that we were facing drought in Malawi within three or four months' time. But there was no funding mechanism for us to put resilience programming in place and to try and respond to that. And that was the really significant challenge. When you went to all of the development funders, they said, 
yeah, we're waiting, we're waiting, we'll wait until the right hits, come back to us in three or four months' time. And at that stage, again, we knew that it would be too late and that we would have lost some of the development gains there. Um, so the funding gap is really significant. Again, that played out in Turkana in northern Kenya in relation to the drought there again. Very similar experiences where we either could access development funding or you could access humanitarian funding. There wasn't anything in between. So there's a particular gap in the middle there around responsiveness. Um, a really important one is shifting management culture. And David spoke to this, and I don't think it can be underestimated. Um, how people think and how they work and how we align ourselves is so huge. And within our own organizations ourselves, that our managers need to be able to bring people together, to be able to plan together, cross-development, cross-humanitarian. It's different languages, different discipline, different strategies, different approaches, and very importantly, very different principles. And that really is quite challenging for us to try and find that middle ground in how we plan together. Um, the inability to adapt. So the fact that through our programming, we plan long-term goals, we set annual targets that we're going to meet, and we're not flexible and adaptive. And because we've signed this off with our donor, or signed it off ourselves in our own minds, that we're not shifting, we're not adapting, we're not changing, we're not working in real time. We're not able to take all of the information and very quickly go, let's do less of that. We need to bring in this strategy, that's not working, shift that up, change that. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks. So just that real challenge of adaptable change management and being a change-ready organization and a culture like that. Um, the do no harm humanitarian principle considerations. And this one is really significant, and I think where I've seen it play out mostly is particularly in relation to targeting. So these really strong principled approaches, which are really valuable within the humanitarian sector, um, and how you balance that within development programming. And so, for example, so we're working with a community where we know drought is going to hit, and we're trying to work with that community to bring in some humanitarian strategies and interventions in order to respond. That community might necessarily be the community that is most in need. The community next door might be the community that are desperately in need, yet we're choosing from a development perspective to focus all of our work there in order not to lose the development gains so that by next year they'll be the community that will be most in need if we don't do that. And there's a real challenge there around addressing need and the fact that from traditionally humanitarian programming, you know, their priority is need. Within development programming, that's not necessarily the first. We're looking at process, as we described it there. That's not necessarily the first thing that we will be thinking about. We'll be thinking in much more longer terms. So a real challenge around targeting and principles there. And being political and non-political and protecting humanitarian space and access. I would very openly say that our work within development programming is political. It's extremely political. It might not be political party political, but it's small p. Everything we do is political. Within the humanitarian context, you know, being non-political, whether at least verbally and articulating this is really, really important in relation to access and again in relation to developing, in relation to being able to have access to address need. So that whole challenge around the politics of what you're doing and where you're positioning yourself and that you may lose your access entirely if you're seen to be too political. If you're doing the governance work that Mike talked to earlier, if you're really engaging with where power is at within governance, that then you may, that will fu may fundamentally challenge you, um, undermine your whole access and your ability to respond. And I suppose then because we work through a partnership model, all of these challenges are seen by our partners at that level. And probably much more challenging for them because they don't have the resources that we as big, large development NGOs have to respond to this. So they have all of the same challenges around. How do you recruit the right staff? How do you ensure that all of your development staff become skilled in humanitarian, which requires a high level of skills and a high level of awareness that those same people? How do you, how do you structure your organization so you have flexibility around funds with your donors, whether your donor is someone like Troker who's working with you or some of the larger, bigger donors there? How do you try and negotiate with your donors constantly to have that flexibility and manage their expectations and all of the compliance um, obligations that are coming with this work? And um, so some of the things that we're learning, and again, this is where the learning, whereas I've talked a little bit about resilience programming within the sort of within the resource rights and use area, very similar learning, I think, that's applicable across the health sector, is that what we're seeing is that humanitarian strategies, interventions, working in this way, is bringing new thinking to development programming that is really useful. And particularly one of the things I've seen is the protection lens from humanitarian, which is something that we haven't necessarily been that strong at. So really, and as we're seeing conflict increasing globally, as we're seeing closing civil society space and more challenges on our partners, and around what we're, again, what Mike was talking about in DRC when he talked about kidnapping, abductions, violence, conflict, 
that within the development setting, using protection for us to better understand that there are some basic things that we need to address first before we can even talk about women's empowerment, women's voice, women's participation. That people need to have protection. And I think that's something really useful for us. A much more sophisticated risk analysis. Because again, the humanitarian sector have been far better at that, and we're learning from that within our development programmings. Emergency preparedness and planning. So just better planning in place around how you shift, how you change. Um, an important area for us as well is who defines resilience. And I think this has been really useful for us, is that certainly coming strongly from emphasizing the process, is that within the development sector, we would have been very strong in communities defining their own resilience. And that's really helping us, particularly in relation to some of our humanitarian work, around going, well, actually, we need to, first of all, most importantly, it's working with each of the communities to define, well, what are the shocks and threats that you're facing? What would resilience look like to you? And how will we know whether you're more resilient at the end of the intervention of this project? Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around adaptive programming this whole doing development differently. And I think adaptive programming is an enabler for us when we try and look at the nexus. Adaptive programming is the idea to be, not to look at this linear idea about programming, but being responsive, being flexible, being fast, being able to do some real-time thinking and changing your program, and not necessarily having one long-term goal at the end, but not necessarily having to articulate everything in between around how that's going to change and how you're gonna get there. And there's a discussion in some of our donors, some donors are leading this, parts of DFID have been quite good and really moving towards adaptive programming. And I certainly see adaptive programming as an enabler for us as we try and bring our humanitarian development work closer together. Um, not in all programs at all times. So it's not, this whole idea of nexus programming is not needed everywhere. In some scenarios it is entirely appropriate and context driven to have a strong humanitarian response and humanitarian in other scenarios, you may have that kind of long-term development and you might not need the humanitarian responses. So it's about knowing geographically, funding-wise, when do you need it and where, like in those four countries, like Ebola in Sierra Leone, when necessarily, when our development partners had to respond to an Ebola crisis very, very quickly and had to switch how they work. And then a couple, two years later, when the mudslide hit, again, our development partners were in a better position to respond because those are the types of situations that you need to respond. Um, and then the other side, the other learning for us, is having a thematic focus. So rather than having these big, broad, conceptual conversations around humanitarian development, peace nexus, to be able to say, well, let's look at it in the context of countries where, for example, slow onset, cyclical drought and floods, what does it look like within this context where it's we really focus on what we do there and how we do that joint programming together. Great. And um, so uh, I guess we would take questions from the floor now for both speakers. Um, unfortunately, Mike has, is no longer with us. Um. Well, I'd like to abuse my position on the panel, if possible. Um, as as uh, MSF, we obviously come from a, a different um, perspective than, than a development perspective, um, largely because of you know our, our history and, and our current kind of funding model which is, is largely independent, well entirely 94% privately funded so we're not reliant on donors and you both touched on this issue but um, we would believe you know trying to come into this as a constructive ally rather than a critic um, that development absolutely has its place um, but we we see some risks in this merging um, because you, 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 you said it yourself Olive, development is, is largely political with a P and, and there are times particularly when states are parties to a conflict, that face, you know, the immediate needs that people are facing are maybe not met from a development perspective. So you, you both touched on this, and the question is for both of you, is how do you preserve that, that kind of space um, where you can do the, the short-term, life-saving humanitarian acts that sometimes we all know are a bit lacking? We're seeing this increasingly as MSF globally. There's a lot of talk, and, and as you know, we withdrew from the World Humanitarian Summit largely because of this. Um, there's a lot of talk about this nexus, but what we're seeing on the ground in more than 70 countries and conflict-afflicted areas and, and whatnot is this development humanitarian nexus is a, slow is a slower approach that can sometimes leave gaps um, that, that we're having to struggle to fill because we can't be everywhere. So how do you preserve that, that pure humanitarian space? Um, because, and, and, and do, oh, first of all, do you accept that that's needed? 
Um, and, and if, if so, how do you preserve it would, would be my question to both of you. And, and anybody else in the audience is welcome to respond as well. No problem. Um, yes, I do want to preserve it. Uh, but that may well be because that's the background that I come from. Um, anyway, so that's my, my interest declared. Yes, I do. I think from the, from the emergency medical team perspective, we need to make sure that this is ingrained as part of what they do and how they operate. Quite difficult when some of them are overtly government actors. But to be honest, those are the ones that tend not to deploy very often. Um, and they largely deploy within their own countries. Whereas I think for some of the others, particularly um, us and Australia, we are sort of quasi-governmental, we're more health service than, than the rest of government. And it is possible to enshrine those, pr those principles and they, they mesh quite nicely with the principles of medical action anyway. And so they're something that people are able to grasp hold of and largely adhere to. Um, in terms of the, the, the melding of humanitarian and long-term development, I mean, this is something that's been going on for some time. And it, it would appear is likely to continue with all that, that entails, good and bad. And of course, on the, the more challenging side, it's, it's the, the issue that, that you, you know, bring up, which is how far are humanitarian actors dragged into the political realm and how far are they seen as political actors? And I think it's clear from what we've seen in many of the security challenges of the last 10, 15 years is they are clearly seen as political actors more so than they ever were. Um, and that's a challenge to deal with. It really is. I don't see it going away anytime soon. And I think that organizations like MSF and the Red Cross need to guard their positions very carefully. And the rest of the sector needs to ensure that those organizations maintain the independence that they have. Because at the moment, very few others do. How can we guard that, so that, that position? Well, you, you, you alluded to it at the beginning, which is your, your 94% of independent funding. Um, I mean, I, 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 I worked in MSF briefly for a while, and I know there have been sort of debates back and forth over how far you accept institutional funding and how far you don't. I would suggest that you should maintain your position, and you should not. Um, and obviously, that means there are limits to how far you can act. And you are, I think, probably acutely aware that the, the health sector is highly dependent on MSF and the Red Cross. As, I mean, I used to be in Mike Ryan's team. And I, I can say that as a team leader for WHO in at least four different uh, L3 emergencies, we were virtually entirely dependent on MSF as the only actor who could scale up immediately. And they were the go-to ones, there's no question. Everybody else obviously brought a lot of capacity, but it was far slower, and by far slower, I mean months, as opposed to days. Um, and I think the world generally recognizes that that capacity that the MSFs and the Red Crosses bring is essential. And I think people play with it at their peril, and they don't really seek to, to be honest. But for the rest of the sector, the things that you talk to are, are a danger. I agree entirely. We, we absolutely need to maintain it, and not even do we need to maintain it, I think we don't have a choice because we'll be forced to maintain it. If you look at all of the crises and the conflict and what we're facing over the next two or three decades, without any significant shift in financing for development, we simply won't have the luxury of, even from a funding perspective, making the choice to work if we chose to in a joint humanitarian development role in each country, because that simply the resources are not there change. Even if we did have the resources, it comes back to understanding exactly that. There are multiple different actors, and each actor has a particular role to play, and it's really us understanding the actor, understanding the role, but continuing being able to discuss and converse and be aware of each other and what we're doing in that. And, and Troger, for example, is an actor that can sit within both of those spaces, and we have an appropriate role, so it's about identifying well, where and when and how and what roles we each have.
Thanks. Uh, great presentations. Thanks very much. My name is Niall Roach. I'm a, an Environmental Health WASH consultant and a member of the Forum for Global Health. Um, we heard yesterday the Irish Aid are going to increase their funding. We're going to meet the 0.7% target by 2030 when we may, we may have 2.5 billion uh, euro in the kitty. Uh, and you mentioned all of that funding is a big gap. And now I look at this from a health systems perspective and finance, of course, is a key building block of any health system. So you need finance in order to deal with the humanitarian development nexus. And when we talk about the emergency cycle, we talk about, mit we talk about prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, early recovery, reconstruction. And in my opinion, a lot of our emphasis at the moment has been on the response and not enough in terms of the building resilience. So in terms of behavior change, because all of us are, are dealing with the issue of behavior change, how do we change the behavior of donors such as Irish Aid to invest more in resilience building with the additional funding that might be available? Thank you. Aid isn't the donor that I'm most worried about. I think our experience with Irish Aid is Irish Aid have been reasonably flexible, is quite interested in resilience. The fact that Irish Aid have already moved and forced us, the whole sector, to put our development programming and our humanitarian programming together is already showing, I think, a significant shift within Irish Aid and a focus on resilience. Um, my bigger concern would be when Irish Aid increases their funding over the next decade, where will that funding go? And the decisions around where you put that funding, whether it is Irish Aid again, it's hard to, to, to beat them with a stick because when you look at other globals donorly, Irish Aid are actually one of the very positive donors that give significant amount of funding to NGOs, to civil societies at some of the higher levels and probably are looking at more institutional funding. So some of the big, the World Banks, the UNs, the WHOs, and I suppose I would have some questions around the balance around where the funding goes to and I think that's what we should be looking carefully at. The donors that I'm more concerned about are the donors like DFID, are some of the big influential donors on the scene, are some of the governmental donors Again, looking at some of the big development banks and where they're moving to and how that. So I suppose, again, when I look at the scene, it's not Irish Aid that I would be first and foremost. It doesn't mean we don't continue focusing and constantly discussing and conversing with them and that, but it's not the one I'm most worried about. Um, and again, I think also the onus is sometimes we as NGOs assume there's less flex flexibility than there is. Sometimes we, we, we put limits on ourselves around how we put our funding and where we use it and ourselves we're not as adaptable or flexible as we can be. So I think first of all start looking at ourselves and the decisions we make around where we put our funding and the assumptions we make about the lack of flexibility. Second part, yes, continue talking to Irish Aid, but my focus is probably wider than some of the donors. But Thanks for the presentations. I'm Michael, not here, Olive and David. Uh, my name is Breda Gahan. I've been working with Concern for over 30 years now. And most of my experiences actually <laughs> have been within and immediately following response to conflict in Iraq two years, Sudan two years, Cambodia three, Mozambique three. So moving towards the development, I would say I'm more a development junkie than a humanitarian junkie. I don't like the media, the fast action. I can do the assessments. But increasingly I see on the ground, and I was a bit late for Michael, I'm not sure if you mentioned, people don't coordinate well with the in-country clusters and the global clusters, and certainly the health and development, the health and nutrition clusters need to jointly work better together. And in Cambodia we had to push, I spoke Khmer language there, because international NGOs come in and want to lead the clusters, it should be in-country government actors leading the clusters and the response with the good people who are on the ground, who know what's happening, who can help, I think, guide us in the best direction in where the investments can be mentioned. And I know da uh, David is it, yeah, talked about the lack of coordination. So I just wondered what your engagement is with the clusters globally and at the country level. Thanks. Right. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of how to approach this because I, I, I was a cluster lead. Um, I, did actually, I did actually do that role in northeast Nigeria and in Bangladesh in Caucasus Bazaar. Um, and there were, I suppose, a number of things that we struggled with. It wasn't necessarily getting the NGOs in the room. Um, it was keeping them there. And it was making sure that they were appropriately engaged and used. Um, 
and could feel part of an, over, of an overarching effort. And the reason that was such a challenge is not because that itself is inherently difficult, it's because the focus was on other things, largely keeping the Ministry of Health on side, whichever country that happened to be, it didn't really matter, to be honest, it came down to the same issues, that the Ministry of Health felt that they were having their toes trodden on. Um, and they were having, you know, the, the, the carpet pulled out. I'm going to mix a whole load of metaphors here. But they, they, they felt that, you know, people were coming in and taking over. And it was their preserve and their decision and, you know, what, what's going on. And that's entirely fair enough, to be honest. So a, a huge amount of time is spent on, on that Ministry of Health relationship. And relationships within the UN family, which are <coughs> Byzantine, frankly, and, uh, you know, th absurdly complicated. And then you look at the actual work, <laughs> which is coordinating a health sector. So it, it, does get, it does get very complex, and it's uh, something that has to be regularly articulated clearly. And many of the cluster leads, um, I think, struggle with, with those dynamics. There aren't enough of them, that's for sure. Um, and I think also it's not helped by the fact that, and I'm lucky here that, that Mike has dropped off, that within WHO <laughs> there is a conflict. There is a conflict between the Global Health Cluster, the EMT Secretariat, and GORN. And um, it's not perhaps, you know, overt or violent, but there is a struggle there. And there are differences of opinion and philosophy, and there are different principles, and there are different ways of working. And this comes out in what we perceive within the health sector as a feeling that things just aren't coordinated properly. It's not because there isn't a will to do it, it's because people fundamentally disagree on how it should be done. Yeah, they do. They do, but you know, NG NGOs are, uh, I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's a bit chicken and egg. You know, NGOs need coordinating, let's face it. You know, we, we're all, we've, we've all been in NGOs enough, I suspect, to know that um, there's an argument over every dot and comma on any document. You know, I mean, that, that's the way NGOs work. We embrace diversity, but part of embracing diversity means there's a need for coordination. Um, and there are bodies charged with that, and if they're struggling to do it, then it's a really, it's, it's a difficult issue. NGOs, I think, need to, within the health sector, need to push WHO to be more coherent. They, they can, WHO will, will listen, um, but it's got to be uh, a, a bottom-up and a top-down, so the governments, you know, the World Health Assembly also has to do it. I mean, they are, but I'm not sure that they fully understand the issue. NGOs are probably closer to it. Yeah, hi, my name is Nadine Ferris France, and I'm um, just putting on my hat as the director of the Work for Change for a moment. Um, I just wanted to talk to Olive's point about um, the programs and how this filters down into the actual day-to-day -day programs. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with Trokra over the past few years in Zimbabwe on a program um, on s that focuses on self-stigma and shame among people living with HIV and more recently um, women who've, been, who've experienced gender-based violence. And in that program, um, we've been able to show really good gains um, in terms of increasing quality of life for, for people, um, improving outcomes around depression, um, and even resilience, building resilience. Um, and of course, that program has a plan and, and uh, objectives to deliver. And two weeks ago, we delivered a workshop there to um, a group of, of coaches. And we went to, to talk about one of the issues um, around you know, shame or guilt or fears that people were experiencing at that moment. And people People needed to talk about hunger. So in the current climate of Zimbabwe, given the political situation, the economic environment, the biggest fear and the biggest issue for people was we haven't got enough food, not only in the training itself, which we have to be adaptable to, because where is the, the, the budget for actually providing the food for people who are hungry, trying to, 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 to engage in these programs, but also in terms of their biggest issue was fear around, f around hunger for their children. And so we had to adapt that, that methodology, which is a good methodology to 
support people dealing with those kind of fears, but that's not in a log frame. <laughs> and that's not in a, a something that we had a plan to report to donors on, and it may not meet the, it may not, you know, ultimately meet it. So flexibility and adaptability is just so important. I'd just like to thank our participants. I don't know. So if there, unless there are any final questions, um, I'd like to just, we'd just like to thank the, uh, the speakers and the audience for um, a really engaging session. Thank you all very much. So welcome again, everybody. Um, so now I'm going to put on a, another hat, and uh, sorry for putting on so many hats, but it did strike me when I came home from Ireland about uh, when I came home to Ireland nine years ago that everybody in the health sector in Ireland has many different hats, um, and now I'm one of those people that has many different hats. So um, I'm I'm the operations director for the Esther Ireland program, which is hosted by the Irish Forum for Global Health. And it's a program um, that is run uh, through the HSC that focuses on institutional health partnerships. And I think David will speak a little bit to that uh, later, I hope. If not, I'll come back. <laughs> uh, so we have a great panel here with us today. Um, and we're talking about a um, slightly different subject. We're talking about um, partnerships and interdisciplinary actions for global health. So we're going to start with our first speaker, um, which is uh, Deirdre Manguang. Is that correct? Um, <laughs> so we're going to start with Deirdre, if that's okay. Um, and Deirdre is the, currently the coordinator of the ORCSI COSEXA collaboration program, which many of you know, and if not, you will find out about just now. Um, she's also worked with MSF. Um, she's done a master's in development, and she's recently back from Zambia and soon on her way to Rwanda. So welcome, Deirdre. Thanks very much. Yeah. If you want to take the floor. better okay no worries um, yeah so yeah so I'll just give you I'm going to set the context a little bit about what global surgery is and then we can see a little bit more about how this partnership program fits into that at a higher level uh, but first we'll start with a bio and the bio and the person I want to introduce you to in this bio this is Salome Karwa um, in November 2014 Salome was on the front cover of Time magazine as one of their people of the year um, she's a nurse from Liberia, and she was, on the, she was a Time Person of the Year because she was an Ebola fighter. And um, we heard about Ebola again mentioned this morning, the current outbreak in DRC. But if you can cast your mind back four years ago to 2014, uh, when the epidemic was in West Africa, and I think 11,000 people were killed in that epidemic, uh, Salome lost a number of family members to Ebola. She contracted Ebola herself, but actually was one of the handful of people who developed immunity, so one of these rare survivors. And even rarer still, she went back to work in the Ebola treatment center after she was cured um, to go on to help others there. Um, unfortunately, Salome died earlier this year, and she died from post-op complications from what should have been a routine surgery, a cesarean section. And when we talk about global surgery, it's people and it's cases like Salome that I think about. These are lives like, um, like talented people, like Salome was in her 20s. She was a skilled nurse, a wife, a mother. And she died, and it's lives that are lost that could have been saved, that could and should have been saved when for lack of surgery. 
Um, surgery was very, for a long time, it wasn't really part of a global health conversation. It was being referred to as a neglected stepchild. I've even heard it referred to as a neglected redheaded stepchild of global health, um, which is really harsh. Um, <laughs> It was the kind, it's probably because it's a very kind of, it's a complex thing to grapple with. There's no one cause, there's many different causes, there's many different angles you can come at to approach the situation. And really up till 2015, there wasn't uh, that much of a concerted drive to do anything about surgery. It was seen as just expensive. It's a luxury option that often people in the developing world don't have access to the surgery that they want. So for developing countries, we're just not able to talk about it at all. But this leads then to catastrophic consequences for patients, for people like Salome. If you just want an academic definition, this is the one from the Lancet Commission, um, and you can just read it there yourself. This is the working definition. And as you'll see, with global surgery, it's quite a broad church. It's very interdisciplinary. It's bringing in research, human rights, um, academic practice, clinical practice. But then what you'll always see when you talk about global surgery as well is global surgery, and then the word crisis will be there somewhere, not too far away. And that's the invariable situation. It is, there is a crisis in global surgery. Um, we're talking about like lack of hospitals, lack of equipment, lack of access for patients to get to those hospitals. And, and then when they get there, a lack of trained personnel to do the surgery. And like these three things, they create, um, it's almost a perfect storm for patients. To give you another example of the sort of the scale of the crisis coming at, at a macro level, um, it's estimated that 5 billion people don't have access to safe, timely, and affordable surgery, these three, these three key things. Um, it'll be no surprise to anybody here in the audience that 93% of those 5 billion people are in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and um, So just a particular element of this when we talk about um, surgical workforce, to give you some comparators of what's actually needed. Um, in Ireland, there's 50 specialist surgical staff for every 100,000 people. When we say surgical staff, we mean surgeons, anaesthetists, obstetricians. The recommended minimum that the Lancet Commission says is 20 per 100,000. That's the target that they're working towards. Um, but in sub-Saharan Africa, the average is 1.8 per 100,000. To further complicate the situation, uh, most surgeons are based in urban areas in metrop metrop metropolis, and most people live in rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa. And as you, as you know, the transport links are not, not easy to get in sub-Saharan Africa. And then it creates a situation where most operations are actually done by non-physicians in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's just the context. Um, so what's RCSI's best response in all of this? Um, everybody here in the audience, I'm sure, knows this, this thing. You know, second part? Yeah, that's familiar. Anybody heard of the third step? Yeah, I grant you. Yeah, thought you were coming on that one. Um, I grant you it's a lot less catchy, but this is where RCSI, um, this is where we get involved. We help local fishing institutions to establish themselves, and we build sustainable international development, institutional <laughs> development. So obviously, we're not doing, we're not experts in fisheries, but what we do is we help a local college, we partner with a college in sub-Saharan Africa to train surgeons. It's a surgical training college that we work with there. And we were talking earlier in the plenary sessions about systems and everything. In many ways, this is a lot less exciting than doing the direct patient care or directly going to set up surgical camps and cure a number of people and fix conditions. You're much more at a back step. You're dealing with strategies, reports. We do a lot of accounting, a lot of budgets. We're talking to policy makers. You're talking to managers, funders. But we really believe that this is what helps strengthen the system, with building into sustainable institutional development. And for something like surgery, it's got to be delivered in a system. It doesn't work if you just try and do it in an ad hoc manner. So for something like this to work, you need a willing partner. You need a local uh, willing partner. And we're very lucky that we partner with COSEXA. It's a college of surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa, COSEXA. Um, I ca call the title of this presentation, the college with, Building a College Without Walls, because that's essentially what COSEXA is. In contrast to this beautiful building that we're really happy to have here in RCSI, because EXA just work out of a small office, but their training is done in accredited hospitals across the continent. So there's currently 12 member countries of COSEXA, ranging from Ethiopia in the north to Namibia in the technical west, but of southwest of, of the continent. Um, and so we have over 600 surgical trainees in training at the moment. They're in doing membership, which is the basic level of surgical competence, and then specializing in one of nine fellowship specialties. 
Um, all the academic component is delivered online and through a bespoke uh, School for Surgeons platform that RCSI has helped COSEXA to build. And it's a very lean, it's a very low cost, and it's a local solution to, it's a local way to alleviate the surgical crisis, the uh, surgical workforce crisis. Also, what we found very much is that if you provide um, higher specialist training in, in surgery for doctors locally available, make it available locally, it stops brain drain. We have a, a, a retention rate of over 85% of graduates of COSEXA are working in the countries where they trained, in their home countries are trained, and over 90% are still based in Africa. So a little bit about the collaboration program. I've say we're funded by Irish Aid. We've been funded since 2007, since the program began. It began with just a handful of projects, one-off projects, which were like helping to develop a curricula for a particular surgical specialty. Then that grew into supporting exams, to the running of exams, examiner, examiner exchange, then to um, gradually became a whole program under the guidance of Irish Aid, who provide the development expertise. And then we, we um, get assistance from right across RCSI. So in terms of management, in terms of finance, budgeting, a lot of IT support because so much of the learning is delivered on, um, online in, in Africa. And for all you people in the Irish audience here who pay taxes in Ireland, you're actually funding this program through Irish Aid. So thank you very much for that. Very mm -hmm. much appreciated. Um, and it's been really successful, I have to say. I've only joined it in the last year, so I can't take really any credit for it. <laughs> but it's been a steadily growing program. Before, um, before RCSI got involved with COSEXA, the number of graduates of the college, there were um, seven, or sorry, 17, but now they've grown to 260 in the last 10 years. And as I said, more 85% of them are staying in the country where they trained, and 90% are in Africa. So numbers are brilliant, numbers are lovely. But what does this actually mean then for patients? Like I talked, started talking about Salome and um, actual patients on the ground. So I'm glad you asked. Um, let me introduce you to two <laughs> special little ladies. This is Bupe and Mapalo Mapwe. Um, they were born in May of 2017. And uh, here they are with their parents, Moses and Lydia. They were born in Zambia, in um, a small village in a very remote area of northern Zambia which is almost a 1,000 kilometers from the nearest uh, hospital with good surgical capacity. Um, the twins were born, as you can see, they're um, conjoined at the liver and the bowel. Mm. Um, their mom, uh, Lydia, she didn't know she was having twins, let alone that they were conjoined. So the day after they were born, they were brought, um, the whole family was brought to Lusaka by ambulance. Um, I was telling you that the average um, for in sub-Saharan Africa for surgical specialists is 1.8. In Zambia, the figures are slightly better than they are now. We're a little bit out of date in this map, but there are four practicing pediatric surgeons in the country, and they're all based in this one hospital, UTH, in Lusaka. Um, luckily for Bupe and, Map and Mapwe, or Mapalo, they met um, Dr. Bruce Volvani here. He, they came under his care. He is a recent graduate of COSEXA, of the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa that RCSI supports. So he and a team of other fellows of the college, plus trainees of the college, they led the first, um, they conducted the first milestone surgery in Zambia to, to um, sep successfully separate conjoined twins um, in February of this year. Um, it was a huge, it was a huge task and involved, everybody got involved with it. It got huge media attention within Zambia. Um, there was a lot of, um, a lot of pressure, um, Bruce was saying about like people kind of making sure that it wasn't ego driven, that we were doing the best for these children that we were supporting the family through it. The family weren't really aware of, of what was going to happen. They'd never been to Lusaka before. Um, there was a whole lot of pressure there, but it was terrific that the surgery was doing well. Previously, conjoined twins would have been sent out of the country for treatment immediately, usually to South Africa, or else a kind of a hotshot international surgeon would be brought in to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this surgery could be done, a, a surgery of this significance could be done in Zambia was terrific for, um, for Zambia, for a country, um, and nicely for Cassex as well to show what we're building up to through this partnership. You can do this kind of work. Um, I had the real privilege of going with, with bringing a journalist from the Irish Times to Zambia last month. And we went with Bruce and his team to the, to the, uh, the Twins Village to see their first, first um, follow-up visit after they'd been discharged. The kids are doing great. They're being spoiled rotten. <laughs> They're meeting all their milestones. And um, for me, like this is what it's all about, a partnership. And, like, for CSI couldn't deliver something like this. We have to let it be delivered within Zambia, within the local institutions, but it works when it's done really well. So listen, thank you very much. I just want to leave you with those links.
sorry, um, just sorry, just one link I didn't, I forgot to put in before um, I sent this presentation on. RCSI are just launching a new institute of global surgery um, very soon, and that's rcsi.com slash Dublin slash global surgery. Find out more there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Deirdre. Fabulous. Thanks for that. Really good to see, um, you know, the good news stories. Sometimes when you come to, to sessions, we talk a lot about the challenges, um, which are obviously really important. Um, and it's just amazing to see um, some of the gains that we have. And I love the idea, just the hot shot, you know, the hot shot international flies in. And in this case, it's the hot shot, amazing local doctor who, who, who succeeds fabulously well. So thanks. Okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to move, if that's okay, for everybody and then come back for questions. So I, I'd, I'd really like to make sure there's as many questions as we possibly uh, can have. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Ailey Higgins, um, who is currently the Research and Analytical Analytics Advisor with Goal. Um, she has done an MPH and uh, she has worked with uh, Ebola in um, Sierra Leone and South Sudan and today she's going to talk, give us some, um, some, a great presentation on accountability and uh, evidence from Uganda's health system. <laughs> Thanks Ailey. She told me that it's like Haley without the H, which was wonderful, so that helped me uh, pronounce her name right. Start at the beginning. Quick disclaimer, this is, I'm presenting on behalf of Goal Uganda, um, so this mm -hmm. is not my baby, this is their baby, so any mistakes are mine. <laughs> um, so we're gonna be talking about accountability um, from in Uganda's healthcare system. So as I'm sure we're all aware, um, poor health service delivery is a major challenge in developing countries, particularly in the rural areas. Um, staff at rural government clinics are often, have absent, have very low attendance rates, um, clinical guidelines aren't followed properly, um, and services such as family planning and antenatal care are underprovided. So all of this kind of plays a part in meaning that there's very low utilization rates at government clinics. So Goal Uganda has been working on ACT Health, which is Accountability Can Transform Health. Um, it's a program to provide community members and healthcare workers with information about the quality of their local health services and how to bring together the community and the health, health service providers to develop some action plans to improve um, the healthcare and create more accountability. So this project has two phases. There's a randomized control trial and then there's, there's also a people-centered advocacy. This is mainly focusing on um, the randomized control trial. Um, so ACT Health is modeled on a 2009 study by Bjorkman and Benson um, called Powers the People, and this study had some really amazing results. Um, it showed that there was huge success with using bottom-up monitoring for health systems. They had um, a 33% decline in mortality in children under five, immunization rates rose, waiting times at clinics fell. I mean, it overall just seemed like an incredibly amazing study, a magic bullet to solve a lot of um, issues in the healthcare system. But a lot of other research isn't getting these same results. So goal is sought to kind of redo this study 10 years on, um, modeling it up on a higher level um, to see if we could do, if we could replicate the results and then um, what aspects of this program were driving these results. So the main kind of theory behind bottom-up monitoring of healthcare services is that we can cut out the having to feed up things to policymakers and then back down and by just going straight between the citizens and the healthcare workers at their, their points of interaction. So the key aspects for doing this um, through ACT Health were information, so citizen report cards on how the healthcare facilities were performing, um, mobilization, so giving having community dialogues where this information is shared with the communities and they can develop action plans on how to address any shortcomings. And then also interface, so they're facilitated meetings between community leaders and the healthcare workers um, with the hopes of generating a social contract of responsibility. So to do this, um, ACT Health did a randomized control trial with four different interventions. So the full intervention, where they get the information, the mobilization, and the interface. A treatment group where they're just getting information and mobilization. A treatment group where they're just getting the interface. And then, of course, a control group. Um, so, unlike P2P, we did this in a much larger area. There were 16 districts. Um, 
We also wanted to look at it over a longer time period. So I think PTP was nine months. We did 20 months. Um, and then we also were trying to break down what the specific mechanisms were um, to figure out what aspect of it was really driving the change. So unfortunately, we did not get the amazing results that PTP did. Um, very small positive results on patient satisfaction, but that was only at the end line. Um, there was some positive impact on treatment quality at midline and end line, but we didn't see any impact on utilization, child health outcomes, or child mortality. Um, so uh, everything that PTP delivered, we failed to deliver on a larger scale, um, which raises questions about the bottom-up model that PTP is pushing. A big part of delivering, doing this study was partnership. So we used a consortium of four local NGOs to help us deliver across such a large area. This allowed us to deliver a larger scale, but also with the same, with a level of quality control because it's equal partnership. There was lots of discussions about how we would deliver this project and making sure that we were doing the same quality across all of the 16 districts. Um, the major um, partnership aspect was program design where the goal was to create partnerships between the community and the healthcare workers. Um, this was done through, that feels good, the exercise slide is here. Um, so three aspects, the three R's, responsibility, responsiveness, and relationships. So interestingly, through ACT Health, we found that we increased responsiveness and relationships, but we didn't manage to increase responsibility of the community members. Um, so a lot of the changes, small, small changes that we did see were from driven by the healthcare workers and less by accountability from the community. Um, this is a huge kind of project. We still got a ton of data that we're looking at and digging through and trying to figure out the particular kind of levers we can push to increase um, accountability in, at the community health level. Um, including a people-centered advocacy aspect as well. Um, so we're still sort of pulling out all the lessons learned and seeing how this can be applied. And then just a quick acknowledgement of our team and our donor, David. Thank you. Thank you, Ailey, and um, thanks for just reminding us that underneath uh, all of the programs that we all are, all are working on, on accountability and good governance, that there needs to be um, some rigorous research and, and we need to understand what these things mean and how our programs, whether they are actually increasing accountability um, as well. So thanks for that. Uh, brilliant. So next we have, um, we have Ayat, um, Ayat Abu Agla. From, uh, she's the focal point um, from the Sudan uh, Medical Specialization Board. Um, Ayad is a medical doctor um, with an MPH as well and an MD in community medicine. Um, she's over a decade of experience and many of you will know her here as a very, very strong and powerful um, advocate for um, issues in Sudan. So I think this shows us, um, she's going to talk to us about this partnership and just show us um, what it is to, um, you know, to be in Ireland and to be uh, forging a partnership um, back home with Sudan. So thank you, Ayat. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Um, well, uh, thank you, Nadine, for that. And yes, I, I'm also based at the Center for Global Please. Health, so others might like look at me and say, well, you're at CGH. Yes, I am at TCD for the past three years as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to uh, take you on a journey that I started three years ago, and that was built on decades of, uh, of relationship between both nations, Sudan and, and Ireland. Uh, this conference is held at a time after the Stana conference, uh, and we're facing serious issues in regards to sustainable development goals, in regards to universal health coverage, and uh, global health uh, challenges, global health workforce challenges are grand. We need 18 million health workers in order for us to attain the universal health coverage in the SDGs. There's distri distributional inequities between different parts of the world and imbalances, geographical maldistribution, skill mix imbalances between health teams and disrupted ratios of doctors to nurses and so forth. International migration of health workers, and I guess Ireland is also one of the countries that suffers from that, as does Sudan. 
and the retention policies and trying to, to find the right fit, to find the right package that will actually retain our health workers within our health systems in our country uh, in remote, rural and hardship areas. And also issues of quality and relevance of health professional education among, among the challenges that actually face the globe. So uh, we're mainly interested in SDG number three. But when we look at the health workforce, it actually cross cuts nine out of the 17 SDGs. So that's how important it is. And uh, we should work accordingly to achieve and attain it. Uh, as you can see, the declaration of Astana, primary health care. We need to recruit, develop, and train health workers, and especially in low and middle income countries. And I come from Sudan. And that's a real challenge for us. Uh, we adopted universal health coverage and primary health care expansion program in 2013 and have been working towards that. But we also need to value the concept of people-centered and integrated health services. We speak about health systems, we speak about people-centered health systems, providing and availing the right health care services to the people to better address these challenges in global health. Uh, only building effective partnership uh, can be one of the main solutions and integrating multi-stakeholders within health and broader than health systems uh, an intersectoral approach is essential. So a bit of background of Sudan, uh, where I come from. We have major human resources for health challenges. We have numerical shortages of health workers, skill mix imbalances, inequitable geographic distribution. 70% of our health workforce is treating 30% of the population located in the capital, Khartoum. Retention challenges uh, within the country itself uh, to remote areas, rural areas. Sudan is a big country, 18 states, and we need a decentralized health system. Massive out migration, more than 60% of our doctors uh, actually live and work abroad, not in Sudan. And uh, quite some are here in Ireland, I would say. Uh, issues of regulation, performance, and productivity of the health workforce are also among the challenges uh, that my country faces. So the essence of the partnership between Sudan and Ireland, uh, it responds to common challenges that we face, uh, whether back home in Sudan or here in Ireland, uh, to strengthen health professional training and development in the context of health worker mobility. And uh, we're committed to the WHO Global Code of Practice on International Recruitment of Health Personnel. So uh, David's here with us. <laughs> David and Dr. Sheikh Bed, which is the Secretary General of the Sudan Medical Specialization Board. So as I mentioned, uh, the partnership uh, leveraged from, uh, from uh, years and years of relationship between both nations in healthcare. And uh, in order to do that, well, we sat and we met from Canada, wherever we found the chance, side meetings, uh, via phone, via email, and in person here, uh, to work on institutionalizing and formalizing this partnership. Uh, up until recently, a couple of weeks ago in Liverpool, uh, um, and uh, through that, uh, an overarching umbrella agreement was signed between the HSE and between uh, the Federal Ministry of Health uh, last November of 2017 here. Um, and as you can see, photos of the agreement, and we're working towards implementing it. So the partnership basically aims to build capacity in healthcare education, training, and research through institutional partnership and exchange to maximize uh, benefits from health workforce mobility in supporting health systems and to improve quality and safety of health care in Sudan and in Ireland. Also to facilitate effective involvement of the Sudanese medical diaspora. And as I mentioned, we have a very big active diaspora here within Ireland, uh, medical and health specialities. And to strengthen medical nursing, midwifery, and allied health professional education and training. So this is our aim. Uh, now, uh, we already have three part programs that are running. And the first is uh, a, a partnership that was fostered under uh, Esther Island. 
and it's a partnership between the Sudan Medical Specialization Board and the Center for Global Health at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and that speaks to the aim number one within the MOU. We also have the International Medical Graduate Training Initiative and uh, it's an uh, ongoing running program. Sudan was in, uh, included and endorsed within the program in 2016 between the HSE and FTBP. And I'll acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, the IMGT committee, Junaid and colleagues too. And uh, it speaks to the aim number three within the uh, MOU and also an active diaspora engagement program that already ran within the Sudan Medical Specialization Board and actually bringing it also here and working with our active diaspora here and the extreme sense of altruism and volunteerism during and every holiday. They go back home and uh, share the knowledge, the technology and the time with uh, residents back home. So the HSE SMSB Postgraduate Scholarship program. Uh, it's a two-year training program in Ireland and as I mentioned it's an agreement signed between the Sudan Medical Specialization Board. Um, the Sudan Medical Specialization Board, if I may say, it's uh, uh, the only national mandated body that produces medical and health specialities. So if I may say it's like all the royal colleges under one umbrella. We have 40 plus specialty councils. Among them is the Surgery Council. And heading the, the, the board now, the president of the board is Professor Abdurrahman, uh, Professor Tayyib Abdurrahman, which is a surgeon who originally trained here in Ireland. Uh, so it's an agreement between the SMSB, the HSE, and the Forum of Postgraduate Training Bodies in Ireland to offer postgraduate scholarship programs. It aligns with the WHO Code of Practice. How? Well, uh, trainers and residents train two years in, in Sudan, and they come and train two years here in Ireland uh, to permit the graduates to complete part of their training. Uh, to ongo the development of their knowledge, to enhance their medical skills and competency. And following those two years, they go back to Sudan to finalize and finish their rotation, sit for their exams, and uh, affiliated, be affiliated to the board to share their learning and training with other colleagues. We had an intake, the first intake was July 2017. Uh, there's a photo with uh, also um, the candidates themselves. Uh, and. Uh, one with Professor Trainer that I had this morning at the RCSI, so it's work ongoing as we speak. <laughs> that was me this morning before the plenary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the second intake, July 2018, uh, increasing in a number of specialties, general medicine, peds, ops and gyne, anesthesiology, and hopefully the third intake uh, this year, uh, July 2019 actually, we also have general surgery. Um, then our Esther partnership between the Sudan Medical Specialization Board and Center for Global Health at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, well, uh, we forged a partnership and uh, we vision to enhance North to South partnership to in strengthen individual and institutional capacity, improve quality in healthcare. We went on two visits up until now, the first needs assessment to see if a partnership was deemed, we agreed on that, we signed an MOU, we put an action plan, and we actively started implementing uh, um, uh, action points within the plan itself. And hopefully, by the end, uh, by December, we'll be going on our third trip. Our diaspora engagement program, and as I mentioned, our migration of health workers is among the difficulties that we face. And we leverage from the diaspora. Uh, we have uh, huge numbers in the Gulf countries, in the UK and Ireland and so forth. So when they come back home uh, within the Sudan Medical Specialization Board, they conduct seminars, workshops, trainings. Uh, we link each a specialist to the specialized council and so forth. So moving uh, towards more training slots, uh, moving towards institutional training and collaboration. This is just the beginning. We're just starting here. Extending collaboration between similar institutes, the Irish Medical Council, Sudan Medical Council, and promote two-way exchange of trainers and trainees uh, within our tropical uh, and uh, um, places within the country. So in the end, I'd like to acknowledge 
uh, all our partners in Sudan and in Ireland. Uh, it's with them that w this was possible, and hopefully through them we will further flourish and grow. Thank you. I love how Ayad said, and this is just a beginning <laughs> after a presentation like that. Um, I've had the pleasure of, um, of working with Ayat and all of her colleagues and um, it's an inspiration how a group of people can decide that they want to do something and where they see a vision and they can make it happen steadily and surely and so professionally over time. And I'm sure it is just the beginning because these guys are phenomenal. Uh, so thanks Ayat. Um, okay, so last and, uh, and not least, um, I don't usually get the, have the pleasure of um, introducing David, given that we worked together for so many years. Um, David Weekliam is the, um, the, lead of the, uh, the lead of Global Health in the HSC. Um, he made, made, wears many, many different hats. Um, he was the, he's the ex-chair of the Irish Forum for Global Health. Um, he's currently the chair of the Esther European Alliance, and he is also the chair of the Global Health Workforce Alliance. And the Esther Ireland program sits um, within David's department in the HSC. Thanks, David. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to come. It's very nice to follow Ayat, because I think Ayat has given <laughs> such a good example of what I'm going to speak about, which is particularly about partnerships where our health service is partnered with health services in other countries and at that level of, of a national uh, level. So what I'm going to do is say a little bit about what we've been doing and what I think we can achieve through these type of partnerships and some of the lessons of you know, what makes these successful or, or otherwise. The, the HSE formally started a global health program in, in 2010. I mean, there were lots of people doing things long before that. But in starting a program, it gave us the opportunity through the health service in a more kind of organized systematic way to look at how we work with other countries. And the vision from the start of the program was that we would work through institutional partnerships, through twinnings and, and, and other types of partnership. The idea being that we have many people in our health service who've got skills to share and we, this, is a, this is a good way to share them. And since that time, many institutions, many individuals, and some of them are here today, have started initiatives and we've seen lots of different institutions develop, developing partnerships. And as we go along, we, we kind of we, we stop and we think, well, what is this all about? What are we trying to do? And is this the best way? What, how can we get the most impact and be most effective? And to think about that, we come back to our framework. Our framework is the Sustainable Development Goals. This is what gives us direction and, and, and motivates us. And, and we're about good health. I mean, we are a, a health service provider, so that is what, that's the goal that we're focused on. But the other goal we look particularly on is number 17, about partnerships. And this is really the, the goal of the 17, that's about the how-to, how do we work with other countries to achieve health, the health goal, but also with any of the goals. And that speaks about technical cooperation between the North and the South. And that's very much what, what we're about. But to look at it in a little bit more detail, we're about improving healthcare. Well, what's it we're trying to achieve? And the target under goal three is universal health coverage, and I'm sure you're very familiar with that. But this idea that everyone everywhere gets the healthcare they need without experiencing financial hardship. And when we look back over the last period of time, we can see there's actually been great progress made in coverage. You only have to look at the health statistics, particularly from some of the the worst off countries, that are the most challenging countries, where you see improvements in child mortality and maternal mortality and major disease, etc. So there's real progress, but that then begs the question, well, what about the remainder? Who's, who have who we not reached? And who are those people? And I like this very much, this idea of leave no one behind. I find that very inspirational because to me it starts to put a face on who these people are we've not reached. And why are they not reached? Is it because of where they live? Is it to do with age, gender, uh, sexual orientation, their lifestyle, uh, because of diseases they've got, because of ethnicity, because of poverty, all sorts of reasons why people have been left behind. And that's, that's what inspires us through, well, how are we going to reach those people? And then it'd be very practical about it, if we're trying to achieve universal health coverage, you can break it down, and this is often presented as ease, the AAAQ, available, accessible, acceptable and quality. 
And in a very practical way, that's what we're about in the HSC, is about improving quality of services and working in a way that they can be more accessible and available to people. So that really led us on to this thing of, for, to reach out to have greater impact. Maybe if we can look at focusing at the national level, working at the country level, where we can reach out to all parts of the country through working with other governments. Now, I have to talk very nicely about the Sudan partnership, so I'm going to talk about a couple of other ones, and ones where we have a little bit of learning at, at this stage to share. So Mozambique started in 2014. The president was here on a state visit and said, could we have a collaboration between Ireland and, and Mozambique around health? So we, we signed an agreement. For the first couple of years, we had lots of talk and exchange visits, but didn't do very much technically. And then a senior person in the Ministry of Health, a new appoint, a per person appointed, came in and said, we want you to work with us to improve quality in our hospitals. So that became the focus for our work. We've trained teams from 15 hospitals over a, an eight-month period around quality improvement methods. And during the training, they, they, they took on projects in their hospitals. We then went on and we trained trainers. And while we were doing that, we worked nationally with the Ministry of Health to try and help them strengthen what they were doing at the national level to support quality improvement. So developing their own policy framework, putting in place structures for quality, and they set up a new director for quality in the ministry. We've, along the way, we're also able to not, it's a, Mozambique is a long way away, but we can do stuff online. We, we did coaching and mentoring through video conferences. And, and, and then while we're out, when we go on visits to Mozambique, then we'd go and visit some of the sites where we'd be, be working with them. And we've seen results from that. We've seen over the last couple of years that where the teams have taken on projects in the hospital, They've got real results. Hospitals where mortality has come down, where there's reduction in stillbirths, where there's improvements in waiting times, where there's a better patient satisfaction. And in all of the, these cases, the projects that they took on were the projects to address issues they identified as problems for them. They picked the problems and then they implemented projects to, to be able to, um, to address them. We did this. and. Um, with a long and close liaison with the Irish Embassy in, in Mozambique, their key partner in this, and also with the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, and we're able to avail of some, some technical expertise from them. But this has, has been, we've seen success so far to date. We recognise that there's a long way to go still for this to be really on a sustainable footing, that the changes that are taking place in these hospitals will continue. But what we see is where we have trained trainers, that they've gone back to the hospitals in some cases and they're now taking on new projects and training other staff. And now we see that quality improvement has become part of the way the hospitals work. And we're starting to see real kind of long-term benefit. Another initiative has been, going back also to 2014, is the, in, with Zambia, the Equals Initiative. Started off with donating medical equipment from our hospitals to Zambia also looking at how to support maintenance of, of equipment. And then along the way, the ministry said, look, we're trying to start a postgraduate training program for a medical specialists, a bit like what COSEX has been doing for surgery. They don't have that, that structure in place. And on foot of that, an agreement was signed between the, the College of Physicians and the Ministry of Health in, in Zambia. But the Equals Initiative is a collaboration between the HSE and, um, and the the Royal College of Physicians. So now, a couple of years on, we now have a regular system of medical equipment going out. There's two containers about to arrive in, in Zambia with equipment that has been identified as needed in Zambia, and that's become available from, from our hospitals. And the government has put in place some of the structures now to start the training program, some of the legislative underpinning that's needed to set up a college, and, and now they're starting to implement training at different training sites. And part of this then, along with the supply of equipment, will enable services to, to improve in the provincial hospitals across the country, where doctors will be trained and then able to provide better services. So there's other countries then coming on stream, and I just talked about Sudan. We, in, in Ethiopia, we started a collaboration there. The, the health minister there asked if <coughs> we could do something there like we've done in Mozambique. So we started, we visited there. Um, I'll come back to Ethiopia because um, it's just interesting starting a new, a new country, some of the, the lessons from that. And Nepal has 
come out of a, a Nepal-Ireland inter-parliamentary friendship group that was established last year. And our parliamentarians here have asked if we could become involved from the HSC in supporting on health. So that's kind of starting up. And new countries could well come on stream, particularly other countries where Irish aid is working in health, such as Tanzania. But I want really just the last couple of slides is just to touch on some what, we, what I think these, these type of partnerships can do and what are some of the lessons. So I think it is all about building health systems. If we're to talk about universal health coverage, coverage and sustainable health care requires strong health systems and that's really what we're doing. A lot of our focus is on the workforce and you're familiar with the six building blocks of the health systems that WHO talks about. One of them is, is, is health services delivery, another one is the workforce and a lot of our work is people working with people to build that capacity. One of the things we do to these type of partnerships is connecting national policies to frontline services. That's what our, the technical capacity we bring is, is around delivering health service. But in order to reach out across a country, it's making that connection between national policies and strategies and then what happens at the front line. And that's really been a feature of, of the Mozambique program. Improving quality and safety of services, that's, that's an important theme. That's where we have our experience we can share. And clearly that's one of the key um, things needed for universal health coverage. It's extending reach for countrywide impact. People are left behind in part because they live in remote areas, so we can help work with countries to, to reach across and to provide care in on, on unserved areas. And developing new services. For example, in Mozambique, we said we've, we've known almost no neonatal services. One neonatologist in the country, could we work with them? And they're interested in a partnership that we're exploring now between the Coombe Hospital in Dublin and their, their main hospital in Maputo. So the opportunities to start and again, this is always in response to their, their express needs where they identify an area of need that, that we can work with them on. And lastly, embed sustainable change. This is a term that we use a bit now, which I think is really getting at what this is all about. Change takes time. And I think by working in partnerships, we can take that time and really work towards sustainable change and embed that in, into, the, into their, their programs and services. So lastly, well, what are some of the things we've learned? And I could spend a lot of time talking about things we've learned, but just touch on a few things that for us we've seen as really important. Local ownership and responsibility. We can't go in and do it. It's, it's, and, and in fact, in Mozambique, as an example, it, things only moved when they identified that there were issues they wanted to work on and were taking responsibility for. And then we could get behind them. And I said I'd come back to Ethiopia, because one of the interesting things there is they've asked us to come and work with them and before we went out, they said, and what are you offering us you know, what to do? And I said, we're not offering anything. It's not about what we have, it's about what you're doing. And we then went on a visit in August, and we visited lots of places and lots of discussions with people, and at the end they said, now what are you going to do? And I was waiting for them to say, now this is what we want you to do. And I think, and so we have to wait. I think we can only move ahead when they have identified an area that they want to work on and where we have a capacity that we can bring to help work together with them on it. So it's local ownership is about the national ownership, but then finding the right people. It is about individuals, leaders, champions, people who are going to make things happen. You have to find the right people and you, and you wait until you have them and then you can make progress. And then with them you start to build support and commitment to address things. Pace is so important, move at their pace. We can, we can implement projects quickly, that's not a problem, but that's not also not sustainable. They have to be, it's their pace we move at. We must always not be a step ahead of them. And it's about taking a long-term view. And that's what I think about our way of working in partnership allows us. We're not going in to implement time-limited projects where we're under pressure to deliver in a certain time frame. We take our time. It may take years, we don't, but we, we have the time. And that's the way we'll, we'll get um, the most success longer, longer term. Work with existing resources. What I really liked about when we went into Mozambique is we went in and said, we've no money. We've got people with skills and we've got our, what we've learned in our own health service and we're happy to share that. If you want to work with us, great, but we're not bringing extra resources. So it is about, do you want to do more and better with what you've got? Because if you do, then we can work with you. And that is, and then you find the right people to work with. And that's what's been very powerful, I think, with Mozambique. It's that people have been we're working with people who are committed to doing better with what they've got. And they have very little, but, they, but you can always do better. And that's what we've seen, even with the resources you've got. And I find so often in Ireland you want to change something, 
if it's all we can't do that without any extra resources. It's, there's so much you can do. Established networks for sharing and encouraging. We have some very vibrant WhatsApp groups where people share what they're doing and people applaud each other. And it, so it's a way of both sharing information, sharing successes, encouraging each other. Involves multiple partners. We're a long way from places like Mozambique and Zambia. So if we can bring in other local partners, work with uh, in Mozambique, we have a regional partner in the Arim Institute that's been very, very valuable partner for providing training materials. I mentioned ISQA here. So it's it, the Coom Hospital, there's different partners can come in and be part of, of the, the wider partnership and celebrate progress. I think it's, that's always good for people. So two, two quotes there. One is from um, that, our counterpart in Mozambique, El Elania Amado, she shared a presentation she did here last year. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that's very apt. That's, it's about long-term success we're looking for, not quick fixes. We're always doing things quick fixes. And then the, the last quote is from one of my colleagues, Lorraine Murphy, who worked on an initiative in Mozambique around prevention of pressure ulcers. That's, that's been quite successful. And one of her kind of lessons that, that she, she said, she said, passion and purpose are more important than infrastructure and resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of quite nicely captures the way in which we, uh, you can work well together. Now, I was about to finish there, and then I realized that Nadine did say, I should say something about the Esther Alliance, and I forgot about that. That was meant to be included mm -hmm. earlier. So last thing is to say, how do we do a lot of this work that um, when the HSE set up a global health program and wanted to facilitate partnerships. One key enabler of that has been joining the European Esther Alliance, which is a Europe-wide initiative of twinning or partnerships between European and countries and less developed countries. And through that, through the, being part of the Esther Alliance, we've been able to avail of, of some funding from Irish Aid, which has allowed us to have a small grants fund to support people to develop partnerships also to run workshops and other things to try and support people who are, who are on the journey. So that's been a very, very good platform for us and that's where our relationship with the Irish Fund for Global Health is so important, where they've been providing some, uh, the, the, their capacity that has made it, it, it possible for us to do that. So I couldn't finish without saying that. So I think the, if there's one, I mean these are all take home messages from me, but I think to me success is about the qualities of partnership and the longer we do this work, the more I'm convinced that if you invest in building the right kind of partnership long term, that's when you'll get the, the results. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, wonderful. So I'm going to open the floor um, for, for questions about um, any, of, uh, any of the presentations from COSEXA and um, all of the work that, that they've been doing, all of the lessons they've learned, ACT Health in Uganda from Sudan and the Medical Specialization Board, and then all the various models of partnership um, that David referred to. So uh, no question is too little or too stupid. Um, and all questions are welcome, all comments are welcome. Um, let's use the time we have to, to hear from you guys. So, yes. Maybe just let us know your name and... Uh, yes, please. Thanks. Hello, uh, Ben Heaven taylor from Evidence Aid. Um, so, I th firstly, thank you for some really, really interesting uh, presentations and some really kind of uh, re really inspiring examples of, of how partnerships can deliver change, I think one of the things that they all have in common um, is that they take time and uh, they, uh, they're, not a, they're not a quick fix, they're not, a, they're not something you can deliver overnight and actually um, one of the challenges within uh, development, development more generally and humanitarianism in particular is, is sustaining funding uh, over time uh, to, to deliver that and I, I wondered to what extent um, sustained financing, sustained support is an issue or whether with enthusiasm actually you can overcome that uh, or, and to what, ex what, 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 kind of, what kind of constraints do you get from, if you like, from the funding environment? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, I'm going to take a few more questions and then I also encourage, there's many people here sitting in the audience who can answer these questions very well as well, so please um, put your hand up if you want to respond. Brida.
Thanks, Brida. Just one more question and then I'll open it. Yes, Sinead. Thank you. Um, my name's Sinead. I'm with Mission Cara. Um, my question is directed towards you, David. I just, um, I don't know if this makes sense, but um, I'll ask it anyways. It's just in relation to the North-South partnerships um, and it often, f I suppose, there's a lot that we can learn from the South also and apply to our own health systems within Ireland. So when uh, through, uh, through the, throughout these partnerships and the learnings, um, where does it go after that? Uh, does it get fed back into our own uh, Ministry of Health and uh, particularly in terms of the health resources? Thank you. Excellent questions. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the panel. Um, we have a question then from Ben on funding and then a specific question for Deirdre, Ayat and David. So let's start with Deirdre and um, whoever wants to answer Ben's question, please go ahead as well. Sure. Um, so in terms of the funding model, um, we're very lucky in this programme, this collaboration programme has been funded from Irish Aid since the beginning um, and then RCSI put in a lot of in-kind support in terms of the expertise and in giving different staff from across the college our permission to travel abroad when needed. However, the most, um, it's not so much people going ab abroad as such, it, most of the work is done by um, local people on the ground in, in the countries in the Casexa region. Um, in terms of funding, because the programme has grown, as I understand it, has grown quite organically, it started with just a handful of small projects that sort of kind of proved a concept and then went from there. And then um, Irish Aid have released the funding in, di in different tranches for maybe two or three years at a go. And they have been, we've sort of grown with them and they kind of understood what, what we were trying to do. Irish Aid don't have that many other um, global surgery programmes that they support. Um, they support a lot of health, obviously, but not, not surgery. So I think it might have been a little bit of uncharted territory for them as well, but they were happy to work with RCSI and trust that um, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland had the expertise to kind of know what they were doing on the surgery side, and then Irish Aid could bring in the development experience and how the best way to go around this. And it's been like it, uh, everybody here has said, it's, it's slow. It is definitely very, very slow, and it's about building relationships. And um, the one thing about our collaboration program, it's this, um, the steering committee is made up of 50% represented in Ireland, and 50% are based in Africa. So the governance of the steering program, it's decisions are made jointly. And to be very honest, sometimes you're walking an intercultural tightrope. You're not sure have things gone the way that they should have or you would have liked them from here. But that's all part of the process and it's going slow. And we've been able to, um, I suppose, the pace of the funding has matched the pace that the programme has grown. So in that way, we're very lucky and secure. And I don't know if that's the same for all partnerships, but it, it's worked for us. Mm -hmm. And Deirdre, the reader's question for you. Um, in terms of surgery, I don't know why it, um, my guess would be in terms of why surgery hasn't become took so long to become part of the conversation for global health. It's just, there was no way, people just, there wasn't no, uh, known how to do it quicker. There are universities, obviously, in the Cossex region that train surgeons. They do an MED program to train a surgeon, but they're only graduating maybe a dozen surgeons a year from those programs. So to scale up to the number that's needed to cover, to pro provide coverage, it's a, it's a mammoth task. Like, Cossex is a model that can do this, and that's what we, we really believe in. But also, I think for a long time, perhaps there was a perception that if you invest in training surgeons overseas and providing this education, you're just trying training them to emigrate. And, um, but now this Cossexa model has shown that it can be done locally and people will stay. And it's not, it's not particularly rocket science. By the time you qualify as a surgeon, you're in your early, mid-30s, likely to have a family, and likely to be established. So if you didn't have to emigrate, you're going to stay at home and, and build your network there. So. That, that's the way it works. Again, I'm not saying that that's the definitely answer, but that would be my perception on it. Thank you, Deirdre. A uh, question for you, Ayat. Um, I'm just going to be, just to let the panelists know, I'm just going to give you two minutes to respond and then open the floor again, because I see many people wanting to ask questions or comment. Ayat. Okay, um, definitely nursing and midwifery and uh, recruiting uh, people into training is a challenge. 2006 uh, National uh, Health Workforce <coughs> Survey showed uh, a huge skill mix imbalance where we had four doc six doctors to one nurse and the benchmark is one doctor, the ratio to four nurses. So a matter of tackling that was establishing the Academy of Health Sciences, which is part of the Federal Ministry of Health at all states and uh, it trains allied health workers, including nurses, midwives, and other health cadres, free of charge. So it's a fellowship program. So you're enrolled within it, within your state, you train, 
you graduate and you're guaranteed a job uh, after graduation. So that's one of the modalities. And also now within the Sudan Medical Specialization Board, uh, we started training nurses and, uh, and midwives as in professional training, not an academic degree, but actually professional specialized training, and hopefully building momentum towards uh, recreating uh, the role models and uh, you know the enthusiasm towards such uh, important and essential cadres. Mm, thank you, Ayat. And uh, David, if you could respond to um, Sinead's question about um, lessons for the North and also touch on Ben's point about yeah. funding, thanks. Yeah, maybe to start with your question. I think that's a great question. And uh, it's something we we're talking about just last week in our management group is how do we bring the lessons we're learning back into our own health service. I would say the last number of years, we've probably been fairly quiet about what we've done when the health service went through a very difficult time here, well, in the, the economic downturn. We probably didn't want to have too much of, uh, being said about stuff we're doing overseas when people say, well, what are you doing mm -hmm. focusing on other countries when we can't get it right here? But I think we're at a point where now we're, we're doing more and, and I think there's more uh, recognition that it's of real value to our own health service as well as the value to other countries. So we need to have a very deliberate strategy for doing that and it's going to be part of our, of our plan next year. So I think what we're doing currently is a lot about communication. So things like staff magazines and other, and other things, we, we share what we're doing with other countries and hope that people might pick up on, on some things from that. But I think I would like in a more deliberate way that we take some of the lessons and we start to, to promote them here because I think there's, there's just a lot that, about the way other countries do things that we can learn from. I mean, some of these countries achieve so much with tiny resources. I think there's, there's so many things we could learn. And I, I've only got two minutes, so I can't, like, we have a long list, but I could think of so many. Um, and I think when you think of where our own health service is going, how much we need to learn from some of these countries about primary health care, about uh, people's participation, and about efficiency. I mean, you, there's so many things. Uh, just on the thing about finance, I, I, uh, I'm always looking for more money and I think we never have enough. And, and yet when I was preparing for today, I was just thinking how much we are able to do without having a lot of funding and how not having money sometimes helps that it doesn't get in the way. And I met someone last week who was involved in Ethiopia as part of an EU-funded project, three years, very big project, lots of money. And I can see the pressure they're under to deliver things. And I think it was quite clear in the discussion, well, to me, I felt that this isn't going to be sustained. Just keep the people they're working with have changed, and, and that, but the project will come to an end and they'll produce reports and it's all about the project. And so we need money, there's the things we can't do without money, but it's finding a way of not to get the money in the way of, of the technical work. I think what we bring the partnerships, particularly is the, the technical capacity and sharing between people. Um, but, but we also, I mean, in Mozambique, we've, we have used, we do, we do need resources, we have a little bit from the embassy. So little, we do need little bits, but we don't always need a lot. Thank you, David. Um, good, and I'm just um, moved to share that um, in one of our Esther Ireland partnerships, the Mayo Londiani, uh, Mayo General Hospital is partnered with a hospital in Londiani, Kenya, and they had an issue with C-sections where in Kenya, the rate of C-sections was, was very, very low, and in Ireland, in Mayo, the rate of C-sections was very high. And over the last seven years, they've worked as a partnership to introduce techniques and training and skills from each hospital back to each other, where they've managed to change that in both directions. So I think there's a lot of learning coming back into, um, into Ireland, absolutely. Um, so opening the floor again, um, Eric wanted to comment, and um, we have one over here, Robbie and then Richard. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you all just to be really brief because it's an interesting topic and many of you would like to share. So just be really brief with your question or your comment. Uh, Eric, you got the mic there? Oh, it sorry, looks like Richard, possession okay. is nine-tenths of the law. So Absolutely. <laughs> Go for it, Richard. Brief as um, you can. Yeah, Richard Firth, I, I'll be brief. Um, I, I, I'm a clinician uh, and uh, worked mainly, well, in America, UK, but mainly in Ireland. Uh, and since semi-retiring, I've done sort of a series of solo runs to West Africa, to Togo in particular, because I'm very alarmed about the rise of the non-communicable diseases, which I think is probably not focused enough on uh, when I see all this. And also, I think West Africa, particularly Francophone West Africa, is really very underfunded in, in terms of health. Uh, we, I have a specific project now, but I was very impressed with, with uh, David's uh, presentation. Uh, I, I self-fund, uh, but... Uh, I'm finding that I'm sort of getting only so far because I'm on a solo run. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to have partners. So 
I'd be very interested in, in joining um, Esther, um, which I'd never heard of. I mean, uh, we inhabit a different universe. We, we, you know, we don't know anything about, about global health and uh, public health and uh, Esther and such things, but um, it's been a very interesting conference, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for that. Uh, Eric, please. Thanks very much. Uh, Eric O'Flynn, I also work um, on RCSI's um, global surgery uh, programs. Um, just to comment again uh, on the funding, I suppose something that we're all, uh, we're all greatly interested in. Um, uh, and taking very much on, on board David's comments about how much can be done with how little. Um, also, I think it is an integral role of partnerships to help the local partner raise uh, funds. We're, you know, when we're talking about fundraising, we're generally probably in this case thinking of fundraising for the partnership. But I, I really think in most cases it should be a role of the partnership to um, enable the local partner to, um, to have a diversified funding basket. Um, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the cause of so many good initiatives failing at the end of a project. Um, that there is no funding stream put in place uh, for them. Uh, and I suppose, you know, um, bringing learning from abroad to home, you know, trying to practice a little bit what we, what we preach around diversity of funding. Uh, in RCSI, we're shortly going to launch an institute of global surgery. Um, and one of the goals for that would be um, to bring in diversified, sustainable funding. Uh, you know, we, we have been um, very well supportive um, on, on various programs with EU and Irish Aid. But uh, we have to, uh, as I say, practice what we preach and uh, mm -hmm. uh, diversify. Thank you, Eric. Yes. Hi, my name is Ambassador uh, Harrison. I'm living in Galway. I started as a physiotherapist, but have become very involved in human rights <coughs> and work with um, refugees and asylum seekers now in Ireland. So, in a, I suppose, a bid to bring it home. I loved all of your presentations, Deirdre. I saw the article in the paper. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I was looking at your presentation on the, the responsibility, and I was wondering um, if you had counterparts. Anywhere I have worked, I always had a counterpart to make the um, whatever was left behind uh, sustainable. So, and it also, because if you have an education, you have a duty to share it. So I think that also gives um, <coughs> duties to the people who are in in the countries that you go to. With regard to this morning, we were talking about um, development and relief and the separation between the two. There never really has been, for me, a d separation between the two because I've worked in both situations and, again, both with education. I also think that it preserves the humanitarian space and diplomacy through education. And you've all mentioned the education very, very strongly in, in your presentations. Um, David, I really liked your presentation. I don't want to put you on the spot, being from HSE, but as I have the microphone. Um, one of the things you mentioned, and, and we were talking about education coming back home now, which is really, really important. Um, one of the things that I saw from um, your presentation in Maputo is the waiting lists have halved from between five hours to three hours, and that jumped out of me, and I thought, is there anything we can do here, please? <laughs> Thank you, great <laughs> questions. Uh, Robbie, last question, really sorry. Go. Hello, so I'll try and make this quick, but I have time for two questions for you, David. And um, so we have identified one key um, element of the success and sustainability of universal health coverage um, is the access to safe and affordable medicines and diagnostics. That's not only in lower middle income countries, but also higher income countries. And um, we're seeing this really in Ireland, we're, we're, we're not even subsidising some of the best medicines out there because they're too expensive. So I guess my question for you is, this is the long term game. How do we change how we currently research, uh, incentivise research and development for new drugs? Um, and I guess my question for you in terms of the HSC and the Department of Global Health is, what's the mood in your department in, in combating this issue uh, and working with your partnerships? And also, what's your mood at working with local but also international treatment uh, advocacy groups? Groups. The mood is the your mood. Sorry, the mood. David, yes. are you clear on the questions? No, not the last one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Again, just we'll just ask. Uh, basically, first, it's like the mood within your department, but like um, what's the mood? Access to medicines. Okay. Yeah.
Thanks, Robbie. Okay, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm just going to, David, start with yourself. There's a few questions in there for you, so if you want to just answer those questions and if there's any last key message you want to leave us with, uh, please do that. And please be, you've got one minute. Yeah. It's not fair to get asked all these hard questions. I only have one minute, <laughs> especially that one from the HSE. Um, why can't we do things here and what can we learn? I mean, it was quite interesting in Mozambique to see when we did the quality improvement training, how they selected their teams for training. Because sometimes we have teams in Ireland go for training and it's people from one department or one area of work. In Mozambique, they selected teams that included people who were the heads of the hospital. So there was buy-in to address the issue from the hospital. And I, I think sometimes when we try to address things like emergency department problems, not everyone is bought into addressing it. Some people have interests that don't necessarily mean that's there, it's not seen as their priority. I think what we've learned from working in Mozambique and other places is that if you change the way you work, you can make improvements, but then everybody needs to work together to do that, and sometimes that's the challenge. And I think we in Ireland, we just also have to get away from these firefighting and quick fixes. Every new minister comes in and they're going to sort it out, and they sort it out and it gets a bit better and then it starts to get worse, and the next minister comes in and starts this thing again. And you need to sort of step back and say, well, what, what are the root, the root problems are long-term. And until we move to a long-term approach and we have a slauncha care, a long-term plan, that's what it's about, long-term. And, um, and um, if we get there, it depends on the willingness to do that. To do that. Uh, on the issue of R&D for new drugs, I mean, I think there are, there are quite, I think, some quite good mechanisms or, or arrangements at, at global level for R&D for new drugs through public-private partnerships. And Ireland is very much engaged with them, and on the development side, Irish Aid funds a number of them, like the, the Medicines for Malaria Venture, the TB Alliance, Developing New Drugs for TB, and the International Partnership on Microbicides. And I think what they do is they, that by bringing public and private together, you introduce mechanisms to incentivize private bodies and researchers to do the research that requires an enormous amount of money to develop products where the they're for mainly if they're for low-income countries, they're not going to get a commercial return. So there needs to be mechanisms to guarantee them return and, and it needs funding. That would need also to come from public sources. So public and private sector working together, I think that's, that, that's the, the way to do that. As for the mood, I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really connected with people involved in that area, so I, I won't comment on that. I just think, well, I think that the SDG 17 is about partnerships. So much of what's called partnership is not, to me, real partnership. And I think that with the way we work in, with through some of our partnerships, but partly because we're not bringing in money, we can work in a very equal way with, with our partners. And I think we're, we can be a good model for how to do good partnership that can be, a, you know, can be applied across whoever's working in partnership. Well, where there's a will, there's a way, and we should change our mindsets into partnership and knowing that it's reciprocity and it's building on and sustaining that, that's the aim. Um, yeah. I would just encourage more partnership between the academic and the NGO communities because I think we bring very different skill sets to the table and could really answer a lot of questions that way. Thank you, Eric. Bridget, there was a last question for you there that came in from, um, who asked you that question? That was my friend. I actually can't remember the question. Okay, good. So last good. message from you. Um, no, I think, I mean, I would agree with everything I've heard here today. In terms of just partnerships, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's people you're talking to. You're building a system, but it's people. It's, it's relationships. It's about being a decent person. And if you say you're going to do something, follow through on those commitments as best as you can and treat everybody equally um, as, as best as you can, no matter where they are in the world or what their situation is. And that's, that's what I would go with. Brilliant, Deirdre. Thank you so much.
Um, and just as I, as I end up with the mic to say goodbye to you, um, just to say that um, on the 29th of November, we will be holding the third um, annual Esther Partnership Forum, which will bring together all many, many different partnerships in Ireland. We have over 30 at the moment who are working in various hospitals, health institutions, hospital groups, GP surgeries, with many different countries in Africa and Asia uh, on totally different topics from NCDs to uh, HIV to maternal child health. Uh, if you're interested, um, come along. Esther, it's, it's on esther.ie and registration, it's in the RCPI 29th of November. And um, so all left to do is just thank all of the uh, amazing panelists and all of you for your patience and your engagement and all looking so awake. Um, please have some lunch and those of you interested for Women in Global Health, don't forget that we are meeting in TR8 at quarter past one to see if we can establish a new chapter of Women in Global Health here in Ireland. Everybody else enjoy networking and please ask as many questions as you can. So for those of you who don't know me, and you probably all do now, I'm George McCrossan from Coal, and I'm just going to introduce the session, the Integrated and Intersectoral Programs section uh, around adaptability and sustainability. And um, this session has been chaired by Jim Clarkin. He's the CEO of Oxfam. Uh, he's also the Executive Director of the Oxfam International Board, and is one of the senior leadership uh, people in, in Oxfam who have programs across 90 countries in the world. Um, Jim, uh, Oxfam have health and advocacy, that's their approach. And he, Jim's a great speaker at lots and lots of international conferences. So I leave him to introduce the chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Geraldine. And uh, it's very often when somebody introduces a great speaker, the only way is down from there, really. Uh, th thankfully, the good thing is you're not, I'm not here to speak, I'm here to chair. So you're gonna hear very little from me. Uh, except just a couple of introductory comments. Uh, first of all, to say a really big thank you to the Irish Forum for Global Health for inviting me to be here with you today. It's a real honor and a, and a privilege. We have been engaged with the, with the forum for many years, uh, primarily through Dr. Anita Friel, who is, who is a, a force of nature within Oxfam, uh, and I think here too. We're very fortunate to have Anita. Unfortunately, she's in Rwanda this week working on, on some health advocacy-related issues as it happens. Uh, so, so regrets not being here, but certainly she is, she is our, our, our lead and our, and our influencer and a very strong thing. I do feel like a bit of an imposter because uh, it turns out that I, my picture is in the, the strategy, which, is, which doesn't feel right seeing as uh, the level of engagement I personally had hasn't been quite, quite where it should be, but I promise I'll try and make up for that. But it is, as I say, it's a, it's a real honor to be, to be here with you today, and thank you very much. Um, I just... I'm going to introduce the panel, but before I do that, I just wanted to say that um, as, as an organization that tries to put women at the heart of everything we do, um, I, I am a little bit uh, <laughs> perturbed at, the, at the, the, the nature of this particular panel. I'm sure all great, really great people, uh, and they are, and you'll hear from them shortly, but uh, I, I have a policy of, of never speaking on what some people call a manal. Um, but I am assured by the Forum for Global Health that there was a lot of effort put into having a, a better gender balance or having a gender balance. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there were a couple of speakers who couldn't make it. Uh, I, I was at the, the Women's Leadership and Global Health uh, session upstairs just a little while ago. And to try and make up for our, our, our lack of balance, I'm going to give a priority to women in the audience to engage in the discussion afterwards. So that's as good as I can do at this point. So apologies. and. Uh, I hope you'll forgive us. Um, so, uh, the, I suppose th this session and the, I love the title, Imports of Integrated and Intersectoral Programs, Adaptability and Sustainability. For those of us who don't live and breathe that to the same extent, I mean, to me, it's really about how do we consider everything else outside of pure health that affects health? And there are so many issues that are connected to our health, to health in a development context, uh, that need to be considered, need to be uh, embraced by those working on health issues. My own personal uh, experience of it was I, I ran a, a large health uh, program in South Sudan a number of years ago, 
And we, we worked out very early on that there was no point in, in trying to run a health program in South Sudan unless you were dealing with water and sanitation as a very basic additional to that. So what, what we're going to talk about today is to look at all of those other issues outside what is traditionally considered to be pure health. Um, and we have speakers, we're going to talk about environment, water, sanitation, air pollution, uh, and equitable access to all of these things and how central it is to, the, to people's survival, to their ability to survive and, and come through disease and, and to thrive. And so that's kind of, for me, that's the kernel of what, what we're here to discuss today and I hope, it's, I hope it, you'll find it to be an interesting session. Uh, I also heard that the, the last day and a half, and congratulations to, to the forum for managing to pull together such an interesting agenda for two days, has been hugely energetic and positive and powerful. So I encourage it to be the same. I know you've just had lunch. I know we're on the last lap, but please, uh, please keep that level of energy because it is, uh, you know, we bounce off each other, we learn from each other, we're here to network and to understand where we're all coming from, and it's very much a learning opportunity for everybody, including myself. So I'd encourage you to keep up that that powerful spirit. So I'm going to introduce all the panel members uh, at the same time, if that's okay. It'll, it'll help to move things along, and uh, I'm going to. Uh, edit their very lofty and uh, impressive uh, biogs and CVs, so forgive me in advance for that. So uh, Martin Fitzpatrick is the Principal Environmental Health Officer with Dublin City University. Uh, he's a graduate from Trinity College, a science graduate. Uh, he was seconded to the World Health uh, Organization way back when, he probably will tell us about that, um, and then came back as the Environmental Health Officer here. Since then, he, he worked he also worked with the Department of Health and Children as Environmental Health Officer. He's worked as a, a consultant and author to the WHO and the United Nations Development Programme on Environmental Health Projects in Europe, Indonesia, Latvia, Kazakhstan, and all over the place, really. He also has spent some time post-tsunami uh, in Banda Aceh, uh, and he has been the Principal Environmental Health Officer with the Air Quality Monitoring and Noise Control Unit of Dublin City Council. That's a great thing to have on your business card. Um, but he's hugely experienced, and we're looking forward to hearing from Martin. Uh, ben Heaven Taylor uh, is formerly from our parish. He was the operations manager for our colleagues across the water at OGB. He has ho held his 20 years of development experience uh, in humanitarian, in both humanitarian and development. He's a, he's a practitioner, I suppose. He'd like to describe himself as. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Evidence Aid, and we look forward to hearing from him. Um, Dr. Israel Balogun uh, is very welcome. He is the uh, studying international comparative disability law and policy at NUIG, or as those of us who were there a long time ago used to call it, University College Galway. Uh, lucky him. Um, he worked as the DID advisor in Nigeria prior to taking up the Robert uh, Roger Casement Fellowship and has great experience with DFID disability programming in Nigeria. He describes himself as a physically challenged post-polio survivor, a medical doctor, and public health practitioner. And I've heard he is uh, quite uh, energetic and uh, animated about the, the things that he really cares about. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Israel. And finally, Dr. Peter Harrington, who is um, from the Gori Malawi Health Partnership. Um, Peter has, uh, he's, he trained as a, as a GP 30 years ago. Am I allowed to say that? Done it. Um, he he also worked uh, at the Mercy Hospital El, in Aldama Ravine in Kenya uh, from 19 from uh, in in the 90s. He was a lecturer uh, here at the RCSI in the Department of, of General Practice. He is a he is a practice owner in Gorey in County Wexford, and he has in recent times been very involved in the uh, in in fact setting up the Gorey Malawi Health Partnership. And we look forward to hearing maybe how he bridges the work that he does here and the work that he's done in Malawi. So that's our panel. Uh, please give them a warm welcome. I'm going to ask them to come up one by one. <laughs> we look forward to our discussion. So we will start with Martin. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm even happy I didn't manage to knock over any of the furniture on the way up, which is always a good start. Um, I should say to you that um, 
some of my housekeeping rules. First of all, you're an experimental group for me. I'm trying to wean myself off PowerPoint, so I'm going to be speaking without the benefit of PowerPoint, but I'll tell you what the slide numbers are as we go, so that you, you can do your own PowerPoint presentation on whatever I say. Um, one of the, one of the, the, when I was asked to speak uh, at, at this conference, I suggested that I would talk in relation to the, the, uh, the take-home messages from the first global conference run last week by the World Health Organization on air pollution and health, which you would hope as an optimistic person is going to be a milestone uh, in terms of going forward. I'm not sure how many of you were in the audience last night in the Mansion House for the climate change lecture. <coughs> Uh, but I think after that, I should actually rename my presentation today as Reasons to be Cheerful. <laughs> a and to maybe strike a, a note of optimism uh, in, you know, in, in terms of what I have to say. So my first slide, if it was up there, would be, be basically talking about some of the facts. And I don't want to spend all the, the and of a timekeeper here who's, who's, who told me she's going to be very strict. I don't spend it all giving you facts. But let me just give you a couple which were reiterated at great length last week in Geneva. First of all, there are 7 million deaths a year globally due to air pollution. 4 million of those are due to ambient air pollution. Over 3 million are due to um, uh, household air pollution. One of the things I learned last week, there's no such thing as indoor air pollution anymore. It, 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 it's, a, it, it, it's a false dichotomy. Indoor becomes outdoor. It kills you either way. So a very significant uh, health problem. 93% of our children globally are breathing air, which is in excess of the WHO guidelines. And air pollution is the second leading cause of non-communicable diseases. And if you look at the burden in each of those major ones, it is very extensive. You're all medics, you know this, I don't have to spend too much time uh, telling you about this. So what we saw last week was a very clear stating of the facts. Uh, and one of the things that emerges from that is we have enough evidence to work with. We can spend a lot of time gathering more evidence, better evidence, let's work with what we have. In terms of some of the comments and stories that, that, were, uh, that were been shared last week, uh, I've been trying to kind of garner a few. Um, so, for instance, the Secretary General of the World Health Organization has described, sorry, Director General, has described uh, uh, air pollution as the new tobacco. Uh, one of his colleagues basically uh, made the analogy that, air, that the air has become the new open sewer, where 150 years ago we dumped stuff without unwittingly uh, in, in, into our water, and now we're doing it in, uh, into our air. One of the very clear things that has emerged, and I think in terms of resilience and adaptability, will, is the central role of cities. We are becoming an increasingly urbanized population globally. So while it's not the whole answer, we've got to look at cities. And as someone who works in a city, for a city, it's obviously something close to my heart. But we've got to see how we can work with cities, because cities are on the front line. One of the great sound bites from last week was, mayors are the new ministers for health. Now, we know a couple of people in Ireland might think, have you met my mayor? And I might have said, but, but, but it actually shows up part of the issue here in Ireland in terms of the strength uh, of, our, of our local government. But certainly globally, the role of mayors and, 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 and politicians working locally as agents of change uh, is, been see is seen as very important. One of the very clear messages that came out uh, from last week is cities are where policy and people meet. And I think that's a phrase you're going to hear a bit more uh, o o over the next couple of, of, of years. Um, I've just come from another um, conference that's happening about 300 yards away, uh, the, the Health and Wellbeing Conference by, by the Environmental Protection Agency and Health Service Executive. And they're talking a lot about green space and blue space. And one of the phrases I heard last week uh, that really resonated with me is, you can measure the depth of democracy in your city by the width of the footpath. And I think, we're again, I think that's, that's something we're going to see emerging uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, we had a very impassioned uh, intervention from the leading thoracic surgeon in New Delhi. Uh, and he basically made the point that when you look at air quality in New Delhi and you compare it to smoking, everybody in New Delhi, when you look at PM 2.5, everybody is smoking the equivalent of seven cigarettes a day. That's children in the womb, including children in the womb and the newborn. During the worst 
episodes during the year, that goes up to about 16 cigarettes a day. So that, that's quite a stark uh, picture. OK, I said I was going to be optimistic. Let me be optimistic. OK, I'm getting there. OK, so the big, uh, just to say that the, the, the big message last week from Geneva World Health Organization is there is reason for optimism, and particularly in relation to the area of climate change. Because what's very clear is if we can use air pollution and health as the driver for change in climate change action, what we can demonstrate is that the benefits are near term and local. And God bless our politicians all over the world, they love near term and local. And this is something that we as health workers for all sectors need to mobilise and get behind that message. Harking back to what was said a moment ago, and it's something that's come home very clearly to me, particularly in global terms, air pollution is a gender issue, particularly when you look at the issue around clean cooking around the world and the production of clean fuel. It is very clearly a mainstream gender issue as well, and again, that's something we need to take on board. So, what can, okay, so you might think that's a lot of nice talking that happened last week. What's actually come out of it? So, kind of hot off the press, basically the situation is the World Health Organization and the family of UN agencies have committed that by the year 2030, we will see a reduction by two thirds in that seven million deaths. That is ambitious. By any stretched imagination, that is ambitious. There's no silver bullet to achieve it, but there's a number of things that will have to happen. One of them is we've got to get back to the realization that breathing clean air is a basic human right. We've already established universal health coverage and issues around water as basic, as basic human rights. We now need to add uh, the right to breathe clean air uh, to that. It, I mentioned earlier clean cooking, and we're surrounded by the SDGs here. Clean cooking is one of those issues that is very much a cross-cutting issue across all, of, across all of those goals, and that is something that the UN agencies will be um, uh, will be prioritising, and there were very strong commitments from a number of governments, some of them quite surprising. You know, you know, I, you know, the, the US government made some very strong public commitments last week in terms of uh, 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 supporting uh, clean, clean cooking technology. One of the reasons why I'm here today is to talk about promoting health workers as agents of change in the whole field of air, qual air quality, air pollution and health because while no one sector, no one profession owns this subject, we all have a stake in it. There was a point made last week where, you know, if you have enough of an income and you're living somewhere where there's an issue with water, you can go out and buy bottled water. You can't go out and buy bottled air. So right across all segments of society, they're, 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 you know, we've all got a dog in this race. One of the issues that we're, go and that we're going to have to address, and it very much plays to the area I work in, is building capacity in terms of air quality monitoring globally. If you look at the map of air quality monitoring across the globe, it almost mirrors poverty. Those of us, those of us who've got the money do lots of it. Those who have too much money do too much of it, but there are huge swathes of blank desert uh, on, that, on that global map, and we need to fill in that, uh, uh, that gap. One of the things that's come across very clearly in relation to that is, in developing countries, they cannot wait to have the incremental change that we had in terms of our capacity. We've got to look to the new technologies in terms of leapfrogging technologies, in terms of the new censoring techniques that are coming on board to be able to do this quicker, cheaper, smarter. One of the other strong commitments that we've had from the WHO is that there will be a trust fund set up for environmental health. So they're actually looking for governments and private sector to put their money where their mouth is in terms of supporting this work. And one of the things that emerged that wasn't there at the beginning of the week, but emerged through the week, and I think it's probably long term, it's a slow burner, no pun intended, but it is an important one, is to develop a uh, an international convention on air quality. And you might think, okay, so what? But if you look at what conventions have done elsewhere in terms of greenhouse gases, in terms of what we're trying to do on climate change, it is moving the oil tanker in the right direction and heading in the right direction. And that was quite an important uh, development last week. 
it's all very well to talk globally, and I've got two minutes. I'll, I'll take one of them. The, the, the last message I want to leave you with is, and this is part of where, as health professionals, we can actually work together. One of the major campaigns that's ongoing at the moment is the Breed Life campaign. If you're not aware of it, go online, Google Breed Life. WHO, just to explain, the Breed Life campaign is where particularly cities will commit to getting their air quality in line with the WHO guidelines by the year 2030. There are, there are a number of cities signed up to that already, but not near enough. Basically, what WHO want by 2020 is that we will have 500 cities globally signed up to breed life, act actively working on getting air that is clean for health. And I think in the context maybe of what we heard last night, hopefully that gives you a little bit of optimism. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I think there, was, there were so many very impactful. Do you want to speak into the microphone for the street? Oh, great, yeah. Sorry, that wasn't working, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, it, it's certainly very impactful. Say that, I mean, for me, one of the takeaways is, is about, the, about the question of cities and those of us who work in the development context and see the huge migration to cities. And we're only at the tip of the iceberg, particularly in developing countries, in, in relation to how potentially long term damaging that is going to be for citizens in, in those cities. Uh, and I love this idea of the near term and local when you're talking about trying to get political uh, mobilization on climate change and, and changing the narrative on climate change to be a near term local issue, which hopefully will wake up the politicians that are clearly fast asleep. Thanks very much, Martin. Now, Ben Heaven, ben Heaven Taylor, please. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, I'd like to, um, before, we, before I start, I, I, just participating in this morning's sessions, listening to, to, to some of those discussions, I think I was, I'd, I'd really like to pick on, up on a couple of themes that really came out quite strongly from those, um, particularly around, obviously, the development, the humanitarian nexus and the need for longer-term uh, perspectives on what might apparently you know appear to be short-term issues that the fact that that's not really a sustainable um, the, the fact kind of focusing on on short-termism is, is not a, a, a truly effective way of, of, of addressing uh, crises um, and the other really being around effective partnerships uh, for um, for humanitarian and and development uh, uh, over time and the fact that um, partnerships for health and particularly from my perspective uh, working for a, a research into practice organization uh, uh, partnerships for, for around evidence um, are really potentially powerful ways of uh, delivering change in uh, many of the world's most challenging environments so just a little bit around <coughs> the organization I work for evidence aid so we were really we were founded um, uh, about uh, 10 years ago now by a group of medical researchers um, from primarily from the Cochrane group um, who were keen to see how they could use uh, medical evidence in humanitarian settings um, and uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to take, uh, if you like, the, the global evidence base ar uh, around uh, what works in medical interventions and to try and apply that uh, in uh, resource poor or crisis settings uh, in the global south. Um, as I say, there's very strong links to the, the Cochrane collaboration, um, and um, but the primary focus really was to collate, was to collate and and get into use uh, systematic reviews um, from the Cochrane Library and from other sources uh, to create kind of practitioner orientated uh, materials uh, to to influence uh, the effectiveness of humanitarian <coughs> program design. So we engage with humanitarian actors. My background is humanitarian practitioner. I feel like a bit of an imposter, just to pick on what Jim said earlier, earlier on. I'm not a clinician, I'm not even a researcher. I come from a practitioner background. Um, but I think it's really important that there are organizations like Evidence Age, which sit, sits between uh, the, the, if you like, the research community, the, the evidence-generating community, 
uh, and the practitioner community to try and uh, ensure that uh, the research that's being generated is, is getting into practice. So ultimately, our aim as evidence aid is to get, is to save uh, lives and livelihoods by supporting what we call e evidence-based humanitarian action. Um, evidence-based humanitarian action is, in my view, not simply taking the evidence base and slavishly trying to follow uh, the path that uh, you're being uh, pushed along by what the evidence is telling you, but using the best available ev evidence and using it as one pillar, if you like, in a decision-making process, which should also include um, also obviously beneficiary feedback, people, people you're working with, actually asking them what they need and what they want, picking up on, again, on some of the themes we heard about this morning. Practitioner knowledge, again, really important that actually you listen to the people who have knowledge of the context where you're working uh, and, uh, and who, who, are, um, who may know uh, what kinds of interventions might work in a given context and also picking up on contextual analysis and, and the practicalities of the, uh, of the environment where you're working with. So if it's actually not physically possible to do a particular intervention, even over the evidence base is telling you to do it, uh, what do you do? And triangulating all of those different things with the very best available, uh, very best available evidence that you can, you can get hold of in any given context. So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the theory of what we do, but I thought I'd in order to try and illustrate what I'm talking about, I'd, I'd take a practical example from my own experience, uh, which was, which, and I, the one I want to focus on is cholera uh, prevention, um, and uh, which was something I was involved with on several different occasions uh, in Eastern DRC uh, in the early part of the last decade and, and towards the, 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 the latter part of the last decade as well. And I think the mere fact that I found myself doing it several times uh, and very often doing the same things on several different occasions reinforced to me the importance that, um, A, this was not a short-term crisis issue, um, and secondly, that uh, we were not learning the lessons uh, either institutionally or globally um, from doing these repeated short-term uh, quick interventions to individual uh, outbreaks of cholera. So just a word about kind of cholera and transmission for those who don't, who don't know, who aren't familiar with it. So um, it's, a, uh, it's caused by a bacteria uh, or a vibrio. Uh, WHO estimate there are typically between uh, 1.3 and 4 million cases a year, uh, which result in anywhere between 21,000 and 143,000 deaths uh, in any given year. The vibrios are tr transmitted uh, via fecal-oral uh, route. They're usually, uh, it's usually transmitted in contaminated food or water. Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the effects, the, the, the symptoms are induced by a toxin released by the bacteria, uh, which, can in, uh, which can induce uh, acute diarrhea or vomiting, uh, and which can lead to uh, acute uh, dehydration, and if left untreated, uh, can cause death. It's, um, it takes a, a fair number of vibrios to actually, um, to, to actually uh, produce clinical cholera. Um, and it, it's interesting to note that between 60 and 90% of, in, of, inf of infected individuals are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. Um, however, the risk of infection is greatly increased um, by, uh, in many resource poor settings where there is poor water and sanitation by the presence of uh, microscopic crustaceans called copepods in the water supply. And unfortunately these act as little magnets which kind of attract uh, the vibrios to them and they, they greatly increase the, the chance of transmission uh, where they're present in the water supply. So um, between one and ten copepods are estimated to be a, a able to carry enough um, vibrios to produce clinical cholera. It's actually incredibly simple to treat cholera, um, uh, primarily by oral rehydration. Um, severe cases may require intravenous fluids. You may uh, use antibiotics to reduce the severity, but primarily it's about uh, ORS and the administration of it. Um, and with prim prompt appropriate rehydration, uh, fewer than 1% of cholera patients die. But without treatment, mortality rates are vastly increased. But uh, I don't particularly want to, I, I'm not going to focus on cholera prevention because that's not primarily where um, I worked. Um, I want to talk more about how you prevent it. Um, most, co most cholera prevention interventions done by 
development humanitarian actors in, uh, in the Global South focus on water sanitation and hygiene promotion, or WASH for short. So that's improving water quality through construction or rehabilitation of water sources, uh, through water treatment or importing clean water, so water tankering, those sorts of interventions. Uh, also by improving your sanitation uh, in a particular uh, environment, so constructing facilities for the safe uh, disposal of excreta. And by public health and environmental health promotion in effective communities, so um, often focusing on the safe storage of water in, in household settings. Uh, and and uh, also um, uh, improve behaviours around hand washing and safe food, food preparation. To go to my kind of current um, focus at Evidence Aid around the evidence base, so what's the evidence base for, for doing wash in, 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 uh, in, in response to cholera or in, in attempting to prevent cholera? Well, there's actually a reasonably strong but fairly patchy uh, evidence base for the effectiveness of wash interventions in terms of reducing the risk of cholera. There's, um, there's a reasonably strong evidence base around some interventions, such as well, dis uh, well disinfection, uh, disinfection treatment of water sources and household-based water treatment, so things like cholera, um, chlorine tablets. Um, but other interventions in, in, in the, under the umbrella of WASH are not actually fantastically well supported by the evidence base. There's a moderately good evidential base for household-based uh, household, um, uh, health promotion, uh, including hand washing. Um, and actually, um, one thing I'd point out within having knocked around the humanitarian sector for a fair few years, actually systematic reviews and, and, and strong evidence base was actually one of the reasons why health promotion was introduced into the mix sort of around 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, alongside the kind of more technical uh, water and sanitation based interventions. Um, so a, an example you think of, of uh, uh, evidence based practice. But I would say generally speaking humanitarian actors or actors in this area do not see their interventions particularly in terms of disease risk reduction. The dominant paradigm I would say in humanitarian settings is still around fulfilling basic needs. So people talk about fulfilling the basic need for water, fulfilling the basic need for sanitation. Um, and um, and it, although some areas are, are well, well researched and have a good evidential base for, 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 for action, there are some really significant gaps uh, in terms of the evidence, ba uh, evidence base. So actually, for instance, there isn't a particularly strong uh, uh, evidence base around uh, latrine building and whether that uh, genuinely has an impact. Um, um, and what, ki what particular kinds of interventions are most effective. And I think the fact that we continue to do, to do that anyway without particularly challenging ourselves to be, to be more evidence-based and, and, uh, and, and more, more robust in terms of our action is partly to do with this kind of dominant paradigm about meeting needs rather than actually addressing risk. I think there's also um, an issue that even where we are evidence-based uh, in terms of a, in a global sense, um, we're, we're not always particularly good at looking uh, at, at comparing and, and using both the local evidence base, if you like, and the global evidence base together. So what I mean by that is that you know, what, what may be true globally, uh, based on uh, systematic review evidence, for example, um, may mask actually the true drivers of disease transmission in a particular locality and result in inter interventions which fail to address uh, a given specific outbreak. So, so in Eastern DRC, for example, if you're, uh, which is the area that I was, um, I'm most familiar with, um, you 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 potentially you're masking some of the some of the local uh, local factors behind this disease transmission. So so in DRC. Cholera is a fact of life. It's a, it's a, it, the, the, I've been in one way, shape, or form involved in humanitarian response and cholera response in East and DRC for, I suppose, around the last 20 years, all in all. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's, it's endemic and it's something which we continually respond to. Um, and indeed, last year there was a particularly severe outbreak uh, which resulted in over a thousand deaths. WASH is a really integral part of the way that humanitarian community deals with cholera in Eastern DRC, and the focus is, you know, largely on, on prevention via, via household-based water, uh, water chlorination and health promotion. 
but the actual mechanism of transmission in, in DRC is really poorly understood by the actors uh, uh, who, are, who are working in WASH in, this, in, in, in that area. And it's not helped by the fact that there's a lack of access to, to um, systematic health data uh, in that particular locality. Actors um, can and some do go digging for, for, for health data, um, but we're not, uh, I think the, the kind of imperative to do something, to act, uh, often over, over, overpowers the, the, the kind of imperative to actually um, seek out a strong evidence base for what we are doing. But actually, if you look at the health data in Eastern DRC, um, there is a really strong correlation uh, between uh, proximity and contact to, to surface water uh, and cholera infection. So many of those who get sick in Eastern DRC, at least in the outset of any given cholera epidemic, tend to be uh, fisher folk, herders, people who go paddling around in water, essentially, um, or people who wash clothes in rivers or otherwise have interaction with, with surface water. So um, by, it's only really by comparing and contrasting uh, the, the evidence base which you are, you are able to collect locally uh, along with a global um, evidence base that you can really come up with um, a sensible approach, a sensible response uh, to uh, this particular disease in this particular locality. So what does this mean? I'm not arguing that we should stop doing water and sanitation health promotion in Eastern DRC. Um, I think health wash interventions properly implemented um, they're really unlikely to do harm. You're not, going to, you're not going to actually harm people by doing them. They may well be beneficial, uh, and it's a good first response. So if, there's an, you know, if, if, if you're needing to respond quickly in an emergency, it's, it's, it's strongly supported by, at least in part, by robust evidence. But I think my, what I'm saying is we shouldn't, look, we shouldn't stop looking for other risk factors. And I think often we, we, end, we, we begin and end with WASH response, and we don't go any further. We don't look into uh, the, um, the drivers of what's causing uh, a disease in any given context. So in Eastern DRC, we, the local data suggests we, we should be looking at interventions around surface water. So should we, should we pay fisher folk to stop fishing? Uh, should, we, uh, should, we, should we be offering other incentives to, to, to stop interacting with surface water? The, the Burundian, I mean, interestingly, uh, um, a, a couple of years ago, the, the Burundian government simply stopped people, pre forcibly prevented people from, from going into the Rizizi River and actually stopped a cholera outbreak in, uh, along the Rizizi River as a result. I'm not arguing we should be uh, working in close partnership with the Burundian, government, uh, Burundian uh, army, but I think, you know, that we should be uh, exploring other forms of intervention which could have a more uh, immediate impact on uh, cholera transmission. Can we, you know, can, can we do better at designing interventions which are more, uh, more sensitive and more responsive to local risk factors? Um, just in terms of, of kind of the, the inter what, what was being talked about earlier today around, around resilience, I think, you know, this, this, the, one of the things which this, this says to me is that the crisis approach to, to diseases like cholera is, is it's not effective and it's actually pretty w wasteful. Uh, as I was saying earlier, cholera in DRC is endemic and it's cyclical. It will keep. It was. It was happening throughout my career in Eastern, in Eastern DRC. It will happen to. It will hap it's, it's happening to people working there now. It's. 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 It's a fact of life. Um, and um, and we need to take a long-term view of that. It's not good enough to simply say, okay, there's a there's an, there's an outbreak right now. Let's respond to that particular outbreak. So we need to be thinking about the local actors um, and building capacity. Uh, around, uh, particularly around data, and thinking about who owns the data. So neither is it, I think, any good enough for international agencies to to like own all the data around uh, issues like cholera prevention, um, because we are we're peripatetic, we're temporary. Um, many of uh, the staff who who operate in humanitarian agencies, they come, they go. The tenure is not long. So we need to be thinking about how and if we can. Uh, embed that um, that data ownership uh, locally, um, and so I think you know capacity building, long term capacity building in the collection, analysis, and use of surveillance data and research is a really fundamental part of building resilience uh, to risks like cholera in Eastern DRC. There have been attempts to do this in DRC. It's not I'm not um, 
Uh, I'm not saying there haven't been, but um, but they have failed most. Uh, well, they have they have all failed actually uh, due to lack of sustained uh, agency and donor interest. Uh, it's really interesting what was said earlier, what was being said earlier on in the in the sessions on partnerships, uh, and I'd li like to pick up. I and mean, one of the things that you know I took away from that was that what really matters uh, in terms of sustaining um, partnerships for um, you know any any kind of partnerships. Um, for long-term outcomes um, is the enthusiasm and the leadership behind them, not necessarily the money. Um, and I think um, what we need to, 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 to understand within the humanitarian development sector is how we can deploy long-term leadership, long-term enthusiasm, um, and, and really get behind long-term initiatives uh, which take longer than three years, uh, your standard project lifespan. Uh, to really um, uh, improve and strengthen the local evidence base to address uh, health risks like cholera. So just to sum up, it's not just about uh, using evidence to slavishly dictate humanitarian act action. Uh, it's about using evidence to ask more intelligent questions, tri triangulating evidence with practitioner knowledge, beneficiary views, and local contextual information. It's about thinking about interventions that build the capacity of local actors to collect, analyze, and act on local, on both global and local evidence base. So that's it. Um, here's a few, this is, uh, these are a few resources from e Evidence Aid. So as I say, we've got um, uh, lots of uh, systematic reviewed evidence that uh, is orientated towards the humanitarian sector and towards health uh, uh, issues in particular in resource poor settings. We also have a new practice guide for humanitarian uh, practitioners on the use of evidence. Uh, so please go and visit our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, there are lots of, lots of interesting takeaways from that. Uh, for those of us who are practitioners uh, working specifically on water, sanitation, and hygiene, who consider it to be a core competence of us in, in many of the contexts that describe it's really challenging because of this idea of fulfilling basic needs versus actually really understanding the root cause of the problem, <coughs> particularly in sustained long-term crises such as, as the DRC. Um, and dealing with this issue of surface water, which I think is, is, is so challenging for us. One of, one of the, the other points that I think is, is so important to re-emphasize is this, the, wh what we need to do in terms of engagement with local actors. Um, we have made commitments as part of the grand bargain from the World Humanitarian Summit to invest far more of our resources in local actors. Uh, we're a long way behind where we need to be there to build up that capacity of people who will always be there, not those of us who come and go when, when, we're, when we're called upon. So there's a big challenge for our sector there. And the final one is just in relation to data. I, I was actually, and all this week in the RDS, there's, a, there's Net Hope, which is this uh, large international organization that we're, we're members of, which are looking at, at digital innovation for development. And you know, this, uh, and a key kind of thought and a key challenge within all of that is the use of data, the safe, reliable, secure, and personalized use of data, and who owns it, and how do we how do we develop systems that are safe? So again, that feeds strongly into, into how you, what you've described. So thanks very much, and we'll, we'll get to speak about that later on. Israel, uh, very welcome, and really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, all. I really want to thank the organizers of this uh, forum, the Irish Forum for Global Health. I would like to appreciate um, the Docker's Disability Inclusive Development Working Groups uh, for their job and what they are currently doing here in Ireland and in the field of disability inclusive development. And I want to appreciate my organization here in Ireland, Christopher Blinding Mission, represented by one of my senior colleagues here, Ruben. Uh, CBM is one of the largest disability organization in the world. We've been around for over a hundred years, working in the field of disability, starting with eye health. Now we have moved to so many other aspects of health. We are into mental health, disability inclusive development, humanitarian response, and also uh, we are working in neglected tropical diseases. So for me, as an individual, I work round the clock as a disability inclusive uh, development advisor. And I want to also specifically thank the Irish government for this real opportunity that they gave to me to come and study here in Ireland. Uh, I want to thank Irish Aid for this opportunity. I'm a Roger Kismet Fellow 
and I'm happy and excited with the fellowship. Every day, I long going to school. Honestly, it has been wonderful. Uh, for me, I, I mean, I'm just auditing every module. <laughs> um, and I want to encourage every one of you, if you are here, uh, I want to encourage you to attend uh, the Disability Law and Policy Summer School. It will give you a better perspective about disability inclusion. Thank you. We all know that um, one billion of the estimated seven billion of the world population are living with disability, and one in seven, all in all. And people with disability are among the poorest of the poor. 80% of them live in developing countries. And when you talk about poverty, they are the most extremely affected. You need to go to developing country to be able to see that. With no social security, no social support. And um, disability over the years have undergone some transitional changes, ranging from charity model, medical model, economic model, social model, and now we are at the right base approach, which is uh, the major thing that we are into, and we advocate for that. Uh, a major change that brought about this was the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which came into being in December 2006, and most countries, about 177 of them have ratified it, beginning from 2007. And I'm happy that the Irish government have also done that this year, uh, which is a plus. And uh, in other words, when you ratify, you also have some responsibility that you need to, you need to do, take and carry out. I'm interested in Article 3, um, 11 and 32. And in Article 3, it says, is, which is the general principle of uh, the CRP, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It talks about the autonomy, non-discrimination, respect for the inherent dignity of people with disability. And Article 11 talks about disability inclusion in the humanitarian setting. I'm glad that uh, my earlier presenter made mention of uh, humanitarian setting. I've worked in the humanitarian setting back home in Nigeria too. And Article 32, which talks about the responsibility of countries that have ratified the convention to play a role in international development efforts. For us in CBM, um, we make sure that persons with disability are engaged in every stage of our program circle management. The next thing we do also is this, to make sure that they are not discriminated in any way. And we also make sure that their voice, their choice, their opinions, both for women, boys, girls, are respected in all our, in all our programs. And also we try to make sure that we demonstrate equal opportunities for women, boys, and girls. So, and we try to make sure that in all our programs, it is accessible for all. As you can see, this building is a little bit not accessible. So, I, we need to work on that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the approach we're going to use, um, which we promote, and we encourage other people to use it. Like, when you talk about disability inclusive development, Persons with disabilities have their voice, dignity, choice, and autonomy respected. They are effectively supported to participate and be fully included in their community as equal citizens. Not second class, not third class, not relegated to the background. If you go to developing countries, some of them, you won't even see them on the street. Uh, they are hidden, tied down behind, hidden from the general public because of the stigma and discrimination associated with disabilities. We don't want that. And we also want the government to make sure that they put in the necessary uh, policy framework and legal instrument that will protect the rights of persons with disability. And appropriate budgetary allocation at national and local levels are made available. And we also want the leadership to ensure that debtors are desegregated by age, sex, and disability. We have different types of disabilities. Some are visible, some are invisible. As we all know, the medical colleagues will understand this. Not every disability is visible. Some are genetic, some are psychosocial, and 
We need to be mindful of that. And also, all national and international development and humanitarian programs should be disability inclusive. Uh, fortunately, we've been laying emphasis on leaving no one behind and uh, the sustainable development goals. We, we had the opportunity of having five goals explicitly, explicitly making reference to persons with disabilities. And these are four, eight, uh, 10, 11, and the partnership thing. However, all the goals are inclusive because we said leave no one behind, so everybody should be involved. So I'm going to give you a case scenario on how you can mainstream disability into your program and policy, which we have done back home in Nigeria. Um, the strategies for doing this is very simple and straightforward. First and foremost, you need to identify and engage with leaders of people with disability at every stage of the program circle management. In other words, we want participatory program planning. We don't want tokenism or tick the boxes. So you just say, okay, you invite one. Okay, we, uh, one person with disability was there. Okay, yeah, his name is uh, A, B, C. You know, we don't want that. We want them to be actively involved. And the other thing is also that uh, we need you to disaggregate data by disability types. Like I said earlier on, we have the physically challenged, we have um, the visually impaired, we have the hearing impaired, we have people with psychosocial disability. We want that data to be splitted by sex, age, and the disability types. And we also want the capacity of persons with disability, organization of persons with disability to be strengthened. Because the tendency is this, when you go to the field, development organization, foreign donors, we say, okay, people with disability don't have capacity, but please build our capacity. Somebody built capacity before they could be able to reach certain levels. So we need that, and we want people with disability to be involved in the advocacy drive. Don't put us behind. Don't speak on our behalf. We can be our own voices. So in this strategy, we tend to promote what we call the twin track approach, which is basically mainstreaming and also disability specific. A typical scenario is this, I'm physically challenged, post-polio survivor. You can see another post-polio survivor. It's also physically challenged, but our needs differs. So you need to make sure that uh, the specifics for individual are tailored to meet their needs. And researches have been done, because I'm also a public health physician. Like I said, I did my master's in London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Researches has come out and uh, the gains uh, of inclusion is significant. But the cost of exclusion, my God, is disastrous. Very, very terrible. I'll give you a story before I round up. We need to also train staff, our staff on disability inclusion in programming and policy formulation, and also engage partners and funders in having interface with the donors. I saw that it worked magic for us back home in Nigeria, and I'm going to share a case, to, a case study that we had. Uh, sitting there, uh, some of our staff and persons with disability, we had a meeting with the outgoing British High Commissioner uh, in Nigeria, Paul Ockright, and what did we go to talk to him about? We said, okay, DFID, you've been investing a lot of money in Nigeria. But however, people with disability have not felt your impact. How can you mainstream disability into your program? He said, well, um, Introduce us to DFID, which is the development uh, I mean, aspect, and we met with the senior advisor. Thank you. And in the press of our interaction, we volunteered. We gave them training. And subsequently, they asked us that we should come up with a strategy uh, of engaging people with disabilities. So one of the things we did was, we said, okay, uh, like I said, I'm a Shivni alumni. I was sponsored by the Shivni uh, by the British government uh, for my master's in London school, I said, okay, let's start with education. A practical example, Shivni Scholarship, I was the first person with disability to have gotten the scholarship since 1983. And it was like, wow. I said, this scholarship is not inclusive. So I started organizing workshop for the mainstream. Then I now cone it down to making it disability specific. As fate we have it, this year alone, we had five persons with disability securing the scholarship and are studying in different parts of the world. And guess what? 
it became a pilot project for the British government. They were really impressed. They were happy with it. And I told them, I said, look, if given the enabling environment, persons with disability can maximize their potential. Don't limit us. You, have, you tend to limit us. You tend to, the stereotype is just too weird. And doing something special, I, I mean, it's, it's not peculiar to us. If given the enabling environment, the right support. Subsequently, these are some of the participants. Uh, some are in the UK, five of them for the first time. Another thing we also did was to engage with government at the national level, meeting with state government, with persons with disability taking the lead. It's not about other without disability. I can't expect us farm to go and talk about poverty among people with disability and just go alone. See you, I will expect you to carry me along and carry the leaders of persons with disability along, including women, boys and girls, if possible. And we also try to influence policy change through participatory approach with people li with disability leading the change. This was the national policy in Nigeria where all, at first they developed the policy, but we say no, whatever you develop, it's not inclusive, uh, nothing about or without us. So we changed the trend and we sat down, we developed it and they were happy with it because we had to introduce the human right approach to it. We don't want charity. We don't want welfare. We don't want, want the medical model. Actually, I have a problem with the medical doctors or the medical practitioners. Sorry, I'm a doctor myself, but I can see that we are stereotypical. Uh, in our dealing with persons with disability, we are too stereotyped. We are more of restricted by the books. I remember my consultant calling me handicapped. I almost slapped him. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Engaging with high power delegation ahead of the Global <laughs> Disability Summit. So this is pretty modern. Uh, before the Global Disability Summit, we sat together and we fashioned out what we want, want to be in the agenda from our country, and it was really great. Uh, before I conclude, why disability inclusion? Almost 10 years ago, I wrote a proposal to address HIV among people with disabilities. And the state where I work in the Northeast region, and they said, how will you get HIV? Your people, your people with disabilities, they marry themselves. How will they get HIV? I said, okay, no problem. Uh, I've gotten the funding. I took the leaders, one of the monitor and evaluation officers, I said, please follow me. I want you to be there. So the first test we did, it was among uh, people with disabilities, about 100, and five of them were reactive. After confirmatory tests, they were also positive. The guy just put his hand on his head. I said, what happened? He said, doctor, come. Doctor, come. There is a problem. I said, what kind of problem? He said, you see that blind man that was positive? He used to be in our neighborhood. He used to be in our neighborhood where they live. And we just chased him out of our neighborhood because he was a pedophile. He was always sleeping and luring girls, young, young girls within the neighborhood and molesting them. And I said then, what is the reason? He said, it's not sure the number of people that will be HIV affected. I said, okay. I said, but you see now, you told me that people with disability cannot get HIV. Now you can see that when you exclude one, the cost can be damaging, catastrophic indeed. I can't imagine the number of people, I, I'm not sure, the number of people the guy will have infected with the disease. So, inclusion is very, very important. The following year, they themselves, without anybody talking to them, they organized a workshop, brought all people with disabilities, and were training them on HIV, counseling, sexual reproductive health, and so on and so forth. In conclusion, I want to encourage you Disability inclusion is a human right thing. It's a development thing. And morally, it's something that we should factor into all our programs. Let us not leave anybody behind. Thank you. See, I told you you didn't disappoint, huh? <laughs> you give people top filling. Um, Israel, thank you so much for that. Um, 
I, I was at the SDG summit uh, in 2015 uh, when, when, the, when the goals were finally signed off. And one of the most striking things for me, and one of the most visible groups there were the disability sector, that, the likes of CBM and many others who were so powerful in their advocacy to ensure that, that the, the SDGs were written with that level of inclusion that had never been considered before to that, to that extent, let's be honest. And certainly as Oxfam, we've learned so much from CBM and others uh, to, to ensure that we mainstream and we have made a commitment to spend at least 10% of our resource on working with, uh, wor working with people with disability and ensure, ensuring that programs are designed with them in mind. But, but most important takeaway for me is the old adage of nothing for me without me. So this is about making sure that, that people with disabilities are, are there at the very beginning of this, when it's first conceived in every stage of design and then delivery and rollout. So very powerful and thank you very much. Uh, finally, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from Dr. Peter Harrington. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about uh, the work in Malawi that I carry out and also very much the work of Joe Gallagher. Uh, we too are GPs in Gori, which is a small rural town about 60 miles south of here. And but we're not working in general practice, we have formed the Gori Malawi Health Partnership. And I should put down a writer about this, two huge people to thank. Without Esther, we wouldn't have got all of this done. Huge supporters and, and uh, very encouraging. So thanks to Esther for our, our, uh, backing our work. And also um, one major benefactor in Gori, Maria Medical Healthcare, who have come on as major sponsors. Otherwise, all the money we've raised has been raised in Gori, apart from Esther. Uh, lots of charity, mostly through our, the efforts of our practice staff. We also take um, additional workers. We're not uh, exclusive, so we have uh, various people joining us. Uh, we have a nurse manager, we have a, a clinical scientist, we have a pharmacist, and this outsiders give us this great energy in the group, and not just those of us who are GPs. Um, I worked in Africa many, many years ago, 30 years ago perhaps. Um, Joe worked there much more recently, but when I was in Africa, uh, an epidemic was caused by a virus or a bacteria or a protozoa, whereas now we have a new epidemic with NCDs. And curiously enough, NCDs are what GPs treat uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So we went to Malawi to the partnership. Joe, having gone back many, many times to Mizuzu, we worked with two institutions in Mizuzu, a government hospital, Mizuzu Central, and St. John's Hospital. And we said, we come from Ireland. We think we might be able to advise you about your health service. And they sort of sniggered and said, what? And not, not really. But I suppose we've had other better speakers than I have spoken about the Irish Health Service. Sarah Burke gave it a great talk yesterday. But if I could just emphasize the, the mistakes, and if Malawi can learn anything from the Irish Health Service, perhaps the errors. It's not a coincidence that Ireland it, you, has a high spend for relatively modest returns when you consider that general practice is relatively underfunded, primary care is relatively underfunded. We have an increased, increasingly specialized, subspecialized consultant and other hospital groups. And there are no generalists left. GPs are the new generalists. And if we need to have universal health care for Malawi, we'll need generalists. So I, that might be one advice they might take from, our, from the Irish model. So again, I, I want to move on from the Altana Declaration, but clearly, I think I'll try to link in what I'm trying to say about asthma to how Malawi might move on with its, with its asthma area, uh, in keeping in mind that the, the, the failure thus far to get universal health coverage. So we went to our partners uh, in these two institutions and other institutions, and we sh um, went back over and over and re-established re contacts, and we said, is there an area of NCDs that we can help you with? And almost universally, they said, asthma. We don't seem to know much about how to manage asthma. And we thought that's something relatively straightforward we could manage or help you to manage because, again, it's, it's, a, it's a symptomatic disease, and it's relatively small compared to other NCDs. So let's, let's start with asthma. And we thought, well, if we're starting with asthma, you know, with the audit cycle in mind, we might just ask ourselves, well, where is the asthma care now in these institutions and where in time might we reasonably expect to get to and then what steps might we take to get there? So, starting with the idea of where is, there, where is our asthma care now? One of my sad moments in, in uh, Mizuza Central was sitting at, at, the, at the ward round and a young uh, uh, clinical officer named Rose had been asked to present about asthma and uh, she presented a really good quality uh, demonstration um, uh, descriptions of symptoms and, and so on. But when she came to therapeutics, she sort of served up this lofty um, formulary of drugs, 
long-acting beta-2 agonists, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, all the sorts of things that we in Ireland take for granted. And I suppose well, I, was, I was rather saddened, and no one challenged, sure, and we moved on to the cases and so on. But I knew, and anyone who had been to the pharmacy knew, that really this is a, 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 a fantastic, in the wrong sense of the word, it's a fable, it's a myth, and we need to start with where we're at. Uh, so where are we? Well, I hope you can see this slide okay. Um, I hope for those of you non-clinicians, I'll broadly uh, try and, uh, don't worry too much, but uh, I'll try and be reasonably uh, clear with what I'm trying to, to convey. First of all, of the sort of resources that one might need for asthma, if you see that all was available, not, 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 not all drugs are always available. And furthermore, what's available is frequently intravenous, the high, st high strength and what's available intravenously. The middle column will tell us we have, we, we rely increasingly on, on asthma management with two forms of drug both of them by inhaler. So asthma is essentially inhaler driven. You've got believer inhalers, uh, oh, uh, sabutamol being the prime one that open up the airways when you're breathless. And we have usually steroid based inhalers which maintain that airway uh, open and reduce inflammation in those with chronic symptoms. So I think I'll come back to these uh, a bit more in detail, but where might Rose have looked for if she wanted guidance about what drugs we should put into our mixture? And this, it was an obvious place. You start with the WHO model list of essential medicines, which is uh, compiled for low and middle income countries. And again, this is the WHO list. And again, if you look at what's available in Mazusa Central, unfortunately, these are the ones in red are available, you will notice um, that we have um, um, uh, very few of our, of our inhaled uh, steroids, uh, our inhaled airway openers are available. And in the very right hand column, be less than for Motoro, which is this combined. Um, steroid airway opening preventer. And again, Malawi is not going to be able to afford this drug anytime soon. So I'm not too sure that model is ideal for Malawi. And you could ask yourself, is a, is a, a formulary that's devised from middle income countries also suitable for a formulary with a low income country? And is it time for a separate formulary for a low income country? When you consider that a low income country could have a, an economy one twelfth the size of a, of a middle income country, perhaps it's time to think about that again. She could have gone to the Malawi uh, national standard uh, formulary, and she would have found more matching um, drugs in that. I want to focus on this. So the drugs in the pharmacy match this a bit more completely, but again, as I said to you, there's no guaranteed supply of, of inhaled drugs. So going through these in a bit more detail, sabutamol tablets, aminophilin tablets, aminophilin intravenous, very, very minimally effective drugs for asthma. Um, Inhaled medications, we said, not available. They recommend the use of nebulizers in a country which we learned yesterday has a 10% um, uh, electricity penetration. So nebulizers are electric pumps required to, to pump out. So again, totally inappropriate. In addition then, another drug, sodium chromoglycate added in, which again is of, of, of dubious value compared to the more potent steroids. So I suppose it's a bad place to start when your own sort of formulary is not particularly um, mm -hmm. uh, um, helpful. In, in addition then, you have two drugs in blue there. In the, in the, uh, if you look at the bus, uh, top of those, magnesium sulfate is available in the pharmacy, but it's not used for asthma in, in, in Malawi. It's a very useful drug. It's used to treat uh, eclampsia on the labor ward, but it can be used brilliantly to treat asthma. So it's a drug they're not using that they could use very simply without actually purchasing anything new particularly. And then it, last point, they were using a lot of intravenous antibiotics, sometimes third generation cephalosporins, we felt quite inappropriately. Antibiotics probably not appropriate for pure asthma treatment unless there's coexisting pneumonia. So it's, you can see where we are starting from and it's a good place uh, to know where you are. Um, so continuing on our questions then, we said to, to our partners, we can help you perhaps starting here to move on and to improve things. And we, we, uh, we worked back and forth with them. And in June of this year, uh, we returned in triumph and uh, formulated and signed memorandums of, grounding with, uh, memorandums of understanding with both of our partners. And this slide, I think, conveys uh, maybe most of the key personnel involved. Joe Galler on the right, together with Master in the pink shirt, they were the Brexit type negotiators back and forth, <laughs> constantly liaising and, and, and creating. And that relationship is what has got us to this point, I think. On my left and right, the two, only two physicians. Imagine a tertiary teaching hospital with two consultant physicians. That's the level of, of doctor penetration. Uh, but they had to be 
brought on side and, um, and, and consulted and very much involved, which they have been. On the left are two clinical fellows, both of whom are clinical officers, and we chose not to employ doctors because they're rare and they move, whereas clinical uh, fellows, or clinical officers rather, are much more likely to stay put. So Chikandi and Temba on the left, a lot lies on the shoulders of these two men. They are key workers in Mazusa Central. And I also demonstrate the use of Italograph. We brought, we brought one donor. So every good uh, partnership is launched with a nice piece of equipment. So the second and third spirometers in all of Malawi are in, now sitting in our two partner institutions with thanks to Vitalograph, who just said, of course, no problem. So working on, we still got to find out more about where we are. We've looked at the drugs, but we've, we have no real uh, data on which to base uh, progress. And so we're sitting down with our, our, our fellows trying to work out where do we go from here? We have generated a, a um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come back to that. We, we, we've generated a number of ways of gathering data, which I move on to. We've also held um, needs assessment workshops to try and establish what the other stakeholders. So apart from the two institutions, we have got the Ministry of Health. We've got two nursing schools in, 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 uh, allied to the two, to the two institutions. And very interesting uh, uh, issues raised at the workshop, including the fact that lots of um, white northerners appear and take their data and then don't reappear. So they would they emphasize the importance of coming back and feeding back to them. We started an informal liaison with the pharmacies to work out what's the issues with supply and can we improve inhaled medications. Um, we developed inpatient and outpatient protocols for management of asthma. And we have flow sheets. So we have an inpatient flow sheet. So this is a, when they're admitted to the wards. This is their admission status, their clinical status, and the drugs prescribed. And that's completed to allow all the. We have got a, a register of all asthmatics for the first time attending the, the, the two universities, uh, the two hospitals rather. So they're on laptops, uh, which we've donated. So that allows us again to do clinical audit. And we have a stamp. Um, so. We had, this is a good example of North-South partnership. This started in the, on, on our computer screen in our surgery. It's an aid memoir for asthma management. It contains all you need to know in a sort of a nine, 10 question. And, and we modified it. We, we worked with our Malawi consultant physicians who said, change these things, add this. And we, um, we now use it as a stamp. It's not on laptop. It's, it's stamped onto the patient's uh, health record and filled out at each asthma contact. And Jakondi and Temba are tasked with moving our, our, the, the, the other uh, staff at the hospital to an inhaler base. So their job is to, is to try and teach a change to inhaler-based therapies. And this is Jakondi uh, trying to show us that. So where might we reasonably expect to get to? And maybe this is kind of the nub of what I have to say. When you move to your formulary, we need to get more like this and not more like the lofty formulary that we Rose imagined. Uh, it's not very uh, sexy, but it works. And the good news is, you know, salbutamol, which is the airway opener, the Asthma Society in Ireland says you take, if you're breathless, you take very breathless, you take a one puff every one minute so you're not breathless. Very simple, very simple. Repeated doses of salbutamol inhaler given, if necessary, by spacer. Um, are, are life are life saving spacers? We learned again from clinical evidence that an evidence base that nebulizers are uh, uh, no more effective than than manufactured spacers. And the other good news is a properly manufactured bottle spacer that's tightly sealed is as good as a manufactured spacer. So these are really helpful. So if I, if I was to give one message to to uh, Malawi in terms of a universal. Um, asthma management. These are the golden six. There's only four drugs. Two of them are spacers, so salbutamol inhaler and the bottle spacer I've talked about. In addition, a baby spacer is needed for tight seal for infants who can't put their lips onto a bottle. You need rapid uh, availability or availability for oral prednisolone or oral dexamethasone, which are steroid tablets to rescue your asthmatics. You need one ampule or some ampules available, magnesium sulfate for very severe asthmatics available intravenously. And you then, for those with persisting symptoms, you need probably beclomethasone inhaler. So we could, by adding beclomethasone effectively, we, by cu cutting out some of the stuff that's available intravenously in our, in our, um, in our as, um, uh, uh, pharmacies at present, we could, by rationalizing, actually have a much more effective uh, system. So I would suggest for Malawi, if 95% of the health workers from the lake to the health centre to the district hospital to the central hospital had this, and the, f the first 
professional at first contact, be it a healthcare assistant or a nurse or a clinical officer, had these skills, we would, we would have much, much better astral care than if we had a small number having second, third line medications. So where am I, uh, what steps would we need to take to, to, to get there? We do maintain contact via uh, Zoom technology. So this is Hastings, our other man. In, he's in St. John's Hospital. He's talking to Joe and myself and Mark, our pharmacist, is sitting in, in Ireland in two different locations. We use Zoom technology to allow case presentations. So they present a case to us. We go through management aspects and perhaps learning points. So it's a clinical mentoring feedback that builds the relationship between us. And these three workers are key. If we can keep investing in them, we hope that they will, they will drive the change in their own institutions. The future, hard to know. Maybe a research arm. We'd like to help with educational opportunities, and, and, and we are already supporting a PhD student at present. Uh, we need to start audits shortly to see exactly where we are and what's changing, and we need to rapidly cycle the audits to, to try and improve things. And I suppose we're also looking forward to visits from our partners and our clinical officers to Ireland in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a fascinating presentation, and, and congratulations on your work. Uh, lots of takeaways from that, I suppose. The, the key one for me is really start where you are rather than starting where you'd like to be. <laughs> um, I've been using the expression recently at a couple of other spaces where, you know, uh, within international audiences that don't quite understand how we speak in Ireland, which can be a bit strange. But particularly in rural Ireland, you know, this, uh, this idea of walking up when you're lost and you're looking for directions and you meet the farmer on the, on the hedge and, and you ask him uh, how to get to wherever it is and he'd say, well, I wouldn't start from here. So, so, Peter, the idea of starting from here is, is so sensible, critical and obvious when you, when you think about it, but not always something that we do. But those real practical kind of solutions to really challenging problems in a resource-constrained environment are, are, are so important to, to all of what we're doing. So thank you very much. Now, it's time for you lot to, uh, to wake up and, uh, and get, get engaged. We have, we have another few minutes. Uh, for Q&A. We've had uh, four fascinating presentations, I, I'm sure you'll agree. So I would really like to hear from you. I'm going to be biased and prioritize, as I said at the start, women questions and speakers. Um, but uh, maybe at the end we might put in a token bloke if you really, if you really feel you have to. But let's see how we go, okay? Uh, so, and we have a roving mic here. Oh, good. <laughs> Please just, uh, everybody knows who you are at this point, I suppose. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> And I might, I might take one or two to, uh, more just to get them, uh, get a little bit of a conversation going. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Let's remember that. Uh, okay. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. Hi. Um, my name is Chedz McLean. I'm a physio and global health advocate um, for Peter Harrington. I'm really interested in the case conferences you mentioned briefly. I was just wondering how often you guys do that and how you plan to make the ownership of the data, which Ben was talking about, make that part of the partnership as well. Great, yeah. And 
Had it a third, maybe? No, nope, only lost two. Yeah, one more question. Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay, go on. I apologise for not being a woman. <laughs> uh, That's a start. <laughs> more to go. Um, just uh, Brendan O'Shea, Irish College of General Practitioners, uh, hugely interested in the uh, Gori Malawi uh, project, and you you elaborated on the on the Malawi side of it, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. Um, as a general practitioner, I'm interested to know uh, how did it impact in Gori? How did it impact in the practice? Um, are the patients aware of it? How does the community actually support it? Um, and if you might just elaborate on that, we'd be really interested. Great. Thank you. We'll, we'll start with that, but I, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Israel to take the first question. And in fact, the question that was put to you, I think, can apply to others as well. So maybe others might like to, to join in that. Uh, thank you very much, Lusungo, for that question. I want to say this. Um, you know, in time past, um, when it comes to the issue of advocacy, people tend to tell people with disability what they want, including the medical profession. We call them the professionals. And without the impute, without the contribution of people with disabilities. Um, so with the convention, you know, prior to the convention, we talked about nothing without us. Nothing about us without us. But we also recognize the fact that people with disability cannot always be there at the forefront. I'll give you an example. I showed you a picture of uh, Paul Lockright. Uh, the British High Commissioner in Nigeria, when I realized that we, the, uh, uh, we persons with disabilities were having challenge in penetrating our government, what we did was we approached him, you know, from the diplomatic channel. You know, the, there's a way uh, in African setting when you see a diplomat coming to talk to your government, I mean, it tends to like here. And he spoke to the Senate President. The Senate President is from my own state. I have close relationship with one of his very good aides, who was a former minister, but I chose to bypass such. It's possible for other people without disability to represent us. But what we are saying is this, when it comes to that, let them listen to us first. Our choice, our voice, they should not go and tell people that this is what they need, but without our own impute, without us being involved in the decision making processes. And also, I want to let you know also that we have parents or people with disabilities who can also be advocates. But in all this, even if you are a parent of someone with disability, we want that child. It's not like coming to hospital and you see a child, uh, the mother will be seeing everything. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not feeling fine. And you know the child is 14 years old. <laughs> can you imagine? 14 years old child, you're asking, okay, he's having a deck, uh, cough, and whereas the child can express himself, let the child, as a doctor, I'm just giving you a practical example, you will be the one to like, okay, mom, I've had you. Let me listen to the child. So we want people with disabilities' voices, their choices, their will and preferences, like my legal colleague would say, <laughs> to suffice in every advocacy. So I can send you, for instance, as Oxfam, because you have a bigger platform than probably most uh, uh, people with disability in Malawi after we have had a consultation together and say, okay, go and present my case before the government. Thank you. Thanks, Israel. And, and I just to say that there might be others who might like to comment on that in a broader sense about full, full inclusion. I mean, maybe Ben, in, in terms of your experience. In <laughs> yeah, yeah. What Israel said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I suppose the, 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 Zoom, the Zoom is every fortnight in theory, but it does sometimes get, we have study days where for some reason our, our clinic officers, they go down to the long way for you know, CPD type days and they aren't available. It, we have had a couple of crashes um, uh, um, in terms of, the da of electricity or um, uh, what, um, Wi-Fi. So, and in fact, one of the side effects is that the two clinic officers from Mizuzu Central, where it's poorer, now go to St. John's or have gone to St. John's at times, and that's got the three of them meeting together as a group, which is an unintended consequence. 
it's not our data, it's never our data in that sense. That we're only trying to, I suppose, a lot of coaxing and uh, these are clinical officers and they're not necessarily used to analyzing data. So a lot of it is sort of, um, is, is patient, um, patient instead of inpatient, it's a lot of prompting and, and the bottle spacer, even the suggestion that you could manufacture your own bottle spacers, it took a little time for them. We got the first picture of the bottle spacer, which I showed triumphantly, but you know, a bank of bottle spacers is not a very big, uh, um, it's a very simple thing for hospitals to institute. So um, I uh, hope that answered that, that question. Uh, Brendan, um, who pl I planted in the audience, uh, the practice is, is, is amazing because actually it's been a bonding exercise. We did, with Joe and myself, after we were at two years ago from Est or Esther Grant, we came back to be just talk to, to the practice about our work one evening in a, far, in a practice evening, all the staff, and in the the hands that went up to say we can raise money. We had a, we've had, a, uh, we raffled a trailer full of logs. This only happens in the country. A trailer full of logs, and we've had a concert in the church, and we've had a table quiz, and we've had um, uh, other things. We have a series of mothers who knit hats for the orphans, and they're they're popped in every so often. So regularly, our patients, the gory gory has its own gory garden, so you can you can sort of easily um, spread around. So the whole town, and regularly patients come in, they drop 50 quid on your table, they say, um, you know, put that into your, into your charity. And in some ways it's been very good. And the town, they like this. They like to get involved. People like to get involved in the area. So I think it's been, um, it's been very useful. And we do feedback to the Guardian about what we're doing. And so it raises awareness and raises developing world awareness, which is nice, because I think it's not, not as, uh, as obvious in the press as it might have been 20 years ago. Good, we have some more questions from here. And did I see another hand in the middle somewhere? Yeah. Sorry, I seem to be asking questions all day. My, que my question, thank you so much for your presentations, all of you. My question is for Peter. I saw your, in your, in your um, presentation that you had a vitalograph. And I'm wondering, was that by choice or by design? Because they have smaller things called Risperidine machines, which are very portable, but they might be too portable for where they're going. Just a question. About that means we're just yeah, and, uh, yeah. here. Um, just a moment. Just a moment. We'll, we'll no, I, I guess Vitalograph chose what they gave us. You know, you know, and again, it's it's been very helpful because again, it's an interesting problem. And we, again, the very uh, Western idea is that asthma in Ireland is the same as asthma in Malawi. It may not be. It may be much more due to smoke inhalation. In which case, it may resemble more COPD. More. So you're kind of typical asthmatic in Ireland. You know, you usually have an onset you know, by your teens at the latest for most people. Whereas we're f if you come in for the first time with asthma symptoms in your 40s or 50s, that may be really COPD, just, not, just from inhaling smoke from indoor cooking. So it's a, we, may, we may find uh, uh, that that's another data area worth, um, worth looking at. But they, have, they found it very helpful, just the raw data has been very useful. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mary Hallexy from Goal. Um, I just had a question for Ben around um, evidence aid, and as I understand it, you do systematic reviews, and I'm just wondering how that information and the the, the um, summary of all that those findings, how that r is reached out there. For example, you spoke a lot about cholera and the, the global task force for cholera control, for example, and their global roadmap now for, for reducing cholera and, and, you know, recognizing that it's totally preventable and, you know, the hotspots and the various strategies that coming up with. I mean, that would be an obvious um, connection there and, uh, you know, how can we, uh, how does that happen? the last question of the day, but um, I just wanted to ask the panel, you know, we produce a lot of evidence. And as a practitioner, I r and as a SPC practitioner in particular, social behavior change, I really struggle to get that evidence into action. I want to know, do you have any great ideas? <laughs> you can point us practitioners in the right direction. or. And I suppose it's like Martin in particular, your, your presentation is great and I, I did read a lot of the things that came out of you know, the last week's uh, environmental conference, but 
I don't know how to put that into action in our programs, if you know what I mean. And we wouldn't, I always feel that when we want to do diversity and we want to do things like that, we don't get the funding for it. We ha you can't be a specialist in everything, but if we're going to include air pollution and we're going to include disability and we're going to include NCDs and, you know, we, you know, we have to have the funding if we're going to do an integrated program. But I just find it as a practitioner of 25 years, not po I haven't seen how it works possible yet, so I'd love some answers. Okay, so shall I just try and answer those two questions together because I, <coughs> I think they're, they're quite similar. Um, I don't pretend to have the answer to the, the, the question because I think it's, it's tough. Um, I think the, the, the problems are pretty deep-seated in the sense that we tend to see, I mean, it's a bit like, you know, what's already been said around, uh, we tend to view that, you know, when, when we do collect data, when we do collect evidence um, as humanitarian access development taxes, we tend to view it as our data, we tend to keep it. Uh, very often within our own institutions, and we kind of bury it, particularly if it's negative evidence. Um, there's a really great graph, which I wish I'd put into my presentation now. There's a really great graph that was, um, it, was a, it was a plot uh, that the, the National Audit Office in the UK did of uh, evaluations done in the public sector in the UK, and it was, it was, a, it was a plot of uh, basically um, the robustness of evaluations done in, in, the public, in the public sector in the UK versus the positivity and there's an inverse proportion. Mm -hmm. Basically, the more robust the study is, the less positive it is. And there is a really good reason why there isn't more data out there, it's because people don't like to be told that they're not very good at something, or to be challenged by negative evidence. So I think that's a, that's a massive barrier. So I think, I think we need, f I, think, I think it's, at the risk of being glib, and I think it's probably about four things. I think it's about, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a responsibility on evidence producers to be simpler in what they're, in, in the outputs and to simplify what they're, what they're putting out there and, and make it clearer in terms of the, the, the recommended actions that come out. And I think, you know, we deal with a lot of systematically reviewed evidence uh, at Evidence Aid and a lot of it um, could be a lot clearer in terms of what the recommended actions uh, are for practitioners and, and trying to hone it out, particularly for time poor people like humanitarian actors who, who they need bullet, bullet points. They don't need a 10-page briefing. They need, you know, they need, they need uh, something which is really clear and straightforward. So I think that's one, that's one. We need to get more evidence out from, you know, behind paywalls, uh, from, you know, data banks and NGOs, uh, you know, in intranet, uh, intranets and or even just buried, full stop. I need to get it out into the public domain. Um, we, need to, we need to create more incentives for, the, for evidence based practice and, and reduce the disincentives because there are disincentives to use evidence, I think, uh, including, you know, um, if, the, if, the, if, if the evidence is telling you to do one thing and the money is actually telling you to do something else, the, the choice is between doing nothing in a really evidence based way or doing s something in, in, in perhaps not an evidence based way. So the choice is always going to be towards doing something. I think, I think that's, that's just that's a really strong negative uh, disincentive. And I think we do need to think about these, these it's, it's about whose data and, and, um, and creating local partnerships, local evidence partnerships um, around, you know, where we have repetitive, um, you know, uh, health crises like, like around cholera, for example, in Eastern DRC. It's got to be, we've got to, we got to, incre we got to increase the investment in the local ownership of data and the, and, and the local coordination of, of action. And it goes back to some of the themes this morning around coordination of, of local actors by, of, of international actors and, and everybody else by local health authorities, by the Ministry of Health, by whoever. But actually the, the data being in their hands and not uh, in, in the hands of you know, people like I, you know, the, the humanitarian actors who come in, who come and they go and they take the data with them. So I think, I think th that would be my, my pen's worth. Let's go next. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I'd like to, I'd like to give you a very direct and very practical example of what you do. And the the, the example I would give you is the fantastic work done by my colleague Professor Luke Clancy uh, in his time as thoracic surgeon in St James's Hospital, where he was looking at these cases coming into him, and made the link 
between he was, what well, he was seeing in terms of premature debt and air quality. And one of, a couple of things that Luke did were very important. First of all, he sought out his allies. He realized that there was, it wasn't simply a medical intervention that would be the answer here. So seeking the allies in terms of finding those local allies who can work with you in terms of persistence, in terms of having an issue, and those of you who were in the Mansion House last night heard a lot about tipping points. If, 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 if you can meld your action to an actual tipping point. And one of the very, very important things is, there's a lot of people in society who are not trusted anymore, but certainly health professionals are generally. And that's something, you know, we, we, we all think of all the scandals, all the things that went wrong, but there's an awful lot of people that have an awful lot of respect for health workers, and you've got to leverage that trust with people. I think that's quite important. But I think, I think it, it comes back to, to the work Luke and his team did is, how do you actually, how do you be just bloody dogged with your information and put it to people in a way that actually emphasizes the benefits as this thing from beating people over the head about what they're doing wrong. It's actually showing people by, by doing simple actions there is actually a benefit for you in this. Thank you very much for that question, and um, it's really, really <laughs> timely. I'm, I must confess here that it's not every um, problem that has a solution, but you can always walk around it. That's just the truth. Um, for us, I discovered that uh, as a doctor working in disability, inclusive development, where I have to work across all projects, I was looking for intersection within all the project, and I realized that there is a possibility you can always link uh, one thing or the other. For instance, asthmatic now, I do tell people, I say people with asth asthmatic attack are persons with disabilities. If you look, use the international classification of function, you know, so uh, I'll suggest this. Uh, I have a lot of ideas because we have been doing it. Uh, one, one of the ways you can do that is like, since there are no money, pilot a case try a pilot case, which you use as evidence for advocacy. I did that with the British government. They say it doesn't work. How will they be able to mainstream person with disability across? But I said, okay, just give me time. Don't give me money. I did it voluntarily. And they saw the remarkable impact. I must confess, while they're in Galway, they are calling me from Nigeria. When will, you, when will you come back? When will you come back? I said, okay, I'm coming. But I had to send some book on mainstreaming to them from CBM website. And they were really happy about it. That's uh, some of their, uh, uh, what's it called, the FID funded pro project. The other thing also is for you to engage with them and say, okay, um, I know there's no fund for this, but can you allow uh, us to mainstream? I mean, since you will have data, you know, sometimes if you look at your data you generate, you use male, female, no disability. Across most NGOs, it's only of recent that they've started changing. Because some of the funders are now insisting that, okay, you must make sure you, you disaggregate data by disability. I know of USID, I know of DFID, they are working on the framework now. And the other thing also you can do, like Jimmy said, Jim said in his organization, they allocated 10% to issues related to mainstreaming in the organization. It's a deliberate policy trust. You know, because if you don't take that charge, you realize that maybe a challenge. You might say, okay, you don't have the expertise, we are here. CBM is in Ireland. Uh, just yesterday, I had a training with um, this, uh, the gender violence group here in Ireland, and they were all amazed, and they were like interested in mainstreaming disability into their programming and policies. So it's something that is possible. Explore the options. So thank you. Thank you very much, Israel. Target, target determination. Use your evidence, start baiting people over the head with it and keep going. <laughs> and, and then be as cute as you can about how you get into the spaces that have that kind of influence that we all need to have. And it's not necessarily a, a straight line, uh, but we, we keep at it and I know that people in this room are very committed to keeping at it. Could I, on your behalf, thank very much our panel, Peter, Ben, uh, Martin and Israel. Thanks to the forum for having us here today. And finally, I, I believe somebody wants to say something.
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Marie Connolly. Uh, sorry I was late to the show trying to get a, a soapbox, but I just want to make a quick announcement about what I do. Um, I'm a nutritional therapist and I'm also doing the SCG program this year with Development pers Perspectives. Um, just the 27th of October, just gone, I organised a wellness festival in my local area called Scary's Wellness Festival. And what I did was took the um, health and wellbeing goal and I combined it with things like climate change, sustainability and made a festival out of it. So uh, at the festival there is free workshops on meditation, yoga, um, how to f uh, do fermentation, um, how to compost your waste, things like that. So um, the goal of that really was to create interest groups out of it and also give people an opportunity to um, try try things that are beneficial to your health, like meditation and yoga. Um, so yeah, I hope it to grow it every year, and if anyone uh, is interested in helping out or getting involved in any way, um, just come and chat to me and I'll give you my contact details. But um, as I said, I'm a nutritional therapist, so I like to kind of, it comes from like a, a functional medicine perspective where you want to get to the root of the problem uh, of disease or, or illness and you know I am interested in getting involved with doctors because it, you know it, it, you can work in a collaborative way and it can be really beneficial so great thank you so there you go burst your way into the agenda however you can do it well done we have a lot to learn um, so thank you very much if the panel wants to uh, get a more comfortable seat or whatever you like we, we just have if that's possible. We have just the final closing session and we did deliberately set the closing at four rather than five or anything like that. So uh, we've just run a little bit over time due to the nature of the, the discussion and really I think we could be here uh, until tomorrow with those kinds of panellists, participants. But uh, in this last session, as you see on the timetable, we're going to have a summary from Ian Hodgson who is facilitating, uh, inspiring and gathering together the global health rights uh, uh, correspondent uh, from the conference. So Ian will, will uh, report back to us on his initial uh, story. Um, we also want you to fill out the evaluations, uh, which is the small little page in your um, pack. I just did mine and there are boxes um, here from Noor and up at the back. So. The, that's really from us, for us to learn uh, what we would do again the same and what we could improve. So thank you for that. And now, uh, Ian, if you're happy to do your little talk. And then Rosie, who's our board member, head of the student outreach group uh, for, the for, for the Forum for Global Health and too many other things to mention. And then we just have the very final words from our our joint, our tripartite team of uh, Forum for Global Health, RCSI and Goal, in case you haven't heard enough from us. But we'll keep everything running smoothly, um, starting with Ian, a smooth operator. <laughs> I'm very healthy, really. Yeah, thanks. I've literally just finished it up there, so I'm sorry if it's a bit so Forgive all the typos, whatever, whatever. That's, um, thanks. So, um, I've been working with a team of writers these last two days uh, in the group Global Health, Health Rights. There were a group of young people, mainly young people apart from me, uh, who, um, well, yesterday we had a workshop on how to write articles and how to report to conferences. And then during the last two days, they've been writing articles based on things they've seen here. And also, thanks, uh, thanks. And also, um, sending updates as to what they think the key themes are that are emerging and the key take home messages and stuff like that. So, um, do the global health rights people, are, th are there any left? Do you want to stand up and say hello to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody else, somebody else? No, 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 okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also, are the TY people here? Yeah, we had a group of TY people, transition year people from one of the schools, they are also volunteering. Anyway, sorry, I know you want to get home. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is about five minutes of kind of impressions from the two days. 
And these impressions are partly mine, partly the global health rights people impressions, and also just things we've heard around. So do forgive me if I miss your presentation out. Secondly, do forgive me if I miss anything really important out, although I must make a, I am gonna mention the fecal sludge management, because that's a completely new phrase I'd never heard of until literally three hours ago. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, but this is just some of the key things that seem to have come out this week uh, from, from the sessions. How do you advance on this? Oh yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna talk about in the next five minutes are firstly what we've done, obviously. Secondly, is that some of the themes that I think seem to have emerged. So I, I've seen these five themes. You may have seen other themes coming out and that's fine, but this is the way I've arranged, um, arranged this. And lastly, finish some, some take home messages to take, take away from certainly the impressions that we've got from the, from the conference that's been going on. So what have we done? We've had plenaries, parallel sessions, and soapbox sessions, which is another new thing. And they worked really well, didn't they, the soapbox sessions, don't you think? It was great. Uh, it was great, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had discussions, networking, and wine, um, in probably in the right order health-wise, but personally, maybe it would have been wine. Uh, meeting for students to explore career options. Many students got up at eight o'clock this morning to go to some um, discussions about global health career pathways, which is really good innovative approach, including, um, including an exercise on how to solve a global health problem, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, we had the launch of the IFGH strategy last night. We heard details of Irish AIDS upcoming um, development policy. And today we also had a Women in Global Health in Ireland open forum. So it's been a full few days. It feels like a few days, but it's literally about, what, eight hours or something? <laughs> maybe more, maybe 10 hours. But anyway, it's been, it's been a good time. It's been a good time. And, oh, it's okay, thank you, that's it. And I hope you enjoyed it. And one of the TY people got this quote from a participant they um, ganged up in, on, on the corridor, I think. So they asked the question, what do you think of the conference? So uh, the response was, I was looking to meet other people interested in global health, to learn, get new ideas, take out time from my normal work, and I've managed to do all these things. So if that one evaluation can be used that would, be, um, that would be good, but we hope you fill in the evaluation afterwards as well. But I thought it was useful to include, because actually we tend to get so swamped in all the information, but at the end of the day, it's a great opportunity to meet colleagues, not be stuck at work, and just to find out what else is going on in our work. So that's, uh, so that's really good. So the first thing I just want to pick up is that problems aren't always international. One of the big themes that's come up this, these, this week, I keep saying this week, these two one and a half days, is that there are also problems in Ireland and therefore a lot of the work we do overseas can be reflected back in Ireland. So some of the things that we've heard about this week are issues around uh, problems with Irish, the Irish health system, um, uh, which is expensive and to quote somebody, it's a poor system for poor people. Uh, and we also heard about the large private health sector in Ireland, which is obviously causes problems when you're trying to deliver a unified service. And we need, need to do at home what we advocate for abroad. Now, this isn't unique to Ireland. It's the same in the UK where I'm based as well in many ways. But this was something that came up in these two days, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, there is going to be an impact on Ireland of cl climate change, which we talked about this morning. This will be slow to emerge, but it does require some quite robust responses, for example, in agriculture and transportation uh, and in community level kind of um, interventions to make sure that Ireland isn't caught out when it comes to climate change. Um, and for climate change, because for change, climate change, because it's so political, there has to be strong advocacy from the community level. And this is something that keeps being flagged up throughout all the presentations we've had, the need for a strong community and good advocates, because they can often produce the most change. Second theme is about the people. Often in our work, and I class myself in this as well, we do forget there are actually people at the end of all the stuff we're doing. So what are the issues facing people? Well, there is a need to empower people to change uh, for themselves, not try and do things for them. That's an old idea in development, but it's still very pertinent, I think. And people are often ready to make the right choice, but the system just needs to enable them to do that. And we heard uh, the examples from Malawi and UHC about that uh, yesterday. Intervi intervention needs to target the furthest behind first. That was a quote we had. And also, we do now have a chance to uh, work for a system where no one is left behind. We do have that opportunity. It, there is the potential to make great change over the next few years 
it's just actually achieving that. Uh, using a rights-based approach, that's been something that's underpinned things coming up this week, and ensuring that global health links with human rights and promotes equal opportunities, respect and inclusivity, which was illustrated just in the last plenary about disabilities and the need to include people with disabilities in processes. Because I know when I, when I did the MSc here 10 years ago, somebody was working on that because she was very concerned that this is something that tends to get missed off the radar when we uh, look at development programmes. Um, so, yeah, there is a need to include people's disabilities, and there's a quote from Israel Balogan, who was speaking just before, thank you. When you exclude one, you cannot imagine the extent of harm to health. Disabilities inclusion is a basic human right, this human right thing again, which is popping up, don't leave anyone behind. And I did have a last bullet point living day to day. Throughout all the last day and a half, all the presentations, has been examples of just people living day to day. So we had a presentation yesterday about women finding it difficult to maintain uh, menstrual hygiene management. Is that the official phrase? That's another phrase I learned alongside fecal sludge management. Um, so there are, the, there are people at the end of the processes we're trying to uh, enable. So how do, we, how do we consider them? The next major theme is integration and coherence. Um, we heard about the need to avoid silos and the way that there are across all the SDGs, and that's something I haven't mentioned yet, but of course this, the SDGs are underpinning this conference, is um, there is a lot of cross-cutting, uh, there are a lot of cross-cutting issues, for example, in environmental health, and now I talked about this yesterday, what's good for climate it is always good for health, and therefore even though a lot of my, well, my work and your work probably as well, is in SDG 3. There are so many cross-cutting elements and we can't think really about development in these silos anymore. It's got to be spread across all the goals we're trying to achieve. And the impacts of SDGs on health, and I gave this example that, it's an obvious example, and it's something that came to mind about 15 minutes ago as I was typing up in the corner. That's, um, for example, improved family planning leads to less children less mouths to feed, less consumption, and therefore less risk to nutrition. Now, it's an obvious thing. In any sense, it's, it's plain to see. But this kind of joined-up thinking, I think, is important to take on from this, um, this conference. And the third point here is fragile and conflict solutions. How do you respond in those situations? And we had some amazing presentations this morning during the plenary about EMT and other interventions in fragile situations, but also their place in the overall nexus. Now, that's a word that not everybody likes, but I think it's a nice word. So this kind of crossover of humanitarian and development issues in a nexus. How do we respond in these kind of situations? What are the barriers? Um, well, they've been obvious this week, I think. Uh, P uh, the great quote from uh, Maureen O'Sullivan last night, uh, people tend to do conflict better than collaboration, which is brilliant. Wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. Stigma is still around, a lot of stigma, uh, which doesn't go away. We heard about the self-stigma toolkit. We heard yesterday from Breda about condom stigma, which again, I haven't heard of that phrase, but it's obvious the people in some countries, Ireland being one, but many other countries, just can't talk about stigma. Uh, sorry, can't talk about condoms because it's so stigmatized. And of course, stigmas prevent, uh, stigmas, you know, condoms prevent HIV as well as STDs and, oh, pregnancies as well. Who'd have thought? But you know, I've, I've, spoke, I've taught many students who, say, oh, I'm okay, I don't use a condom, but I'm on the pill, so it's okay. You know, well, yeah, but, you know, whatever. Um, the growing challenge of uh, NCDs, uh, that came up, and also continuing lack of skills to support uh, healthcare workers and how to return them in their country, that was popping up uh, quite regularly. And also, just before this session in the plenary, problems with the lack of r robust evidence in some of the work that we do much of the stuff we do instinctively feels right, but do we really know that's the best option of the possible options? Um, so that's important not to forget. Now, I did skip one um, bullet point, uh, mobile populations. There's one example given from Sudan, but uh, this is a big issue, obviously, across the whole of Europe. How do you support people who one day are in one country, then relocate to another country, then relocate to another country, how do you keep track of all the public health challenges in those populations? We had some solutions presented, which was nice. We had data collection tool solutions. Um, I heard last night or yesterday about some capacity building for how to do gender analyses at country level and also uh, implementation research to measure the, measure the performance of community midwives in Sudan. Uh, we heard about solutions to public health challenges in rural Uganda, for example, uh, stockouts and 
staff absenteeism in a rural health community? How, how do you deal with those issues? We heard about the need for clarity around advocacy. If we do want a government to do something, what's the messaging? And we heard the example from Malawi about UHC, which is very clear now what is needed. So can the community push to get that achieved? We heard a lot about resilience and the need to consider that many problems just keep popping up. The old continuum model of a problem, an intervention, then it sorts itself out has gone, it has gone in many places now. You have a problem with intervention, then the problem recurs, or a similar problem, then a similar problem again, then another intervention, and this could go on for years. So how, how do we build that into our programming? We had some innovations like e-health for young people and mental health. Uh, issues and also the toolkit for self-stigma and also the collaboration issue again and David Weekly had this nice quote which I've heard before but it's nice if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together so final take-home messages then to finish what what did we think were the most important things to take away firstly issues are often universal because stigma cross cuts or the SDGs cross cuts so are the better ways, A, to learn from the past, and B, to transfer between uh, sectors and contexts? Secondly, big words this, uh, these last two days, community engagement and inclusivity, the importance of community in its broadest sense, being involved in policy and planning. Nothing for me without me, I think I used that before, but certainly in the HIV sector, that had a huge impact on building up a strong, robust community response to HIV. And why can't that be used in other contexts as well? Thirdly, facilitating communities so they can do it themselves, empowerment is fine, but we, only, we can only really do that when we find out what they think they need, what they want, and what we can provide them in achieving. So it's a kind of participatory approach. Fourth, uh, fourth point is harmonization. Uh, global health is often fragmented, scattered between N uh, NGOs, NGOs, communities, governments, uh, and other people. Um, so how can, we, how can we build more harmony between all these people working on the ground in certain places? Fifthly, sustainability, big issue. We have talked some about this week, the, these last two days, not a huge amount, but this quote, um, I think, uh, illustrates that sustainability and the issues around it aren't going to go away. They're going to get worse in some ways, A, because funding streams are changing across the world. Secondly, civil society spaces are shrinking, particularly heavily marginalised and punitively treated populations like HIV drug users um, and gay men, lesbians. And therefore, how do you build in programmes that are sustainable within those contexts? It's still a challenge, it's, and it's always been a challenge, but we shouldn't let it fall off the radar. And lastly, uh, getting more out of less, funds globally are shrinking, so how can we build on what's there already? So we've got something in place, so how can we make that stronger? And we did hear of some ideas this in the last two days about something is there so a tool a tool has been used to evaluate it and then you go in and strengthen it rather than doing something completely new then just parachuting it in to sort out the problem which could have been solved simply with what you have there already so thank you so much thank you for listening and uh, thanks again to the global health rights team thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. and uh, i'll pass it over to you thank you so much thank you Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian, and all the team. So next is Rosie. I forgot to mention, amongst all her roles, she's a medical student in NUI Galway. So um, delighted to have Rosie um, talk to us about the student young professional competition and outcome. Thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, I won't keep you long. Just wanted to mention that the Irish Forum for Global Health has a, a national student network. So we have a group in every university in Ireland um, that I welcome you all to tap into. They're interested in doing global health research with NGOs or other, um, and we hold regular events and meetings, so you can always get in touch if you want students to work with you. So this morning we met really early because we, we didn't want to take the students out of the regular program, so we met in the morning, and we had some great uh, workshops on a career in global health. And then I gave them a team challenge to solve. So I broke them into teams of two. And um, they, they had to solve the issue of uh, air pollution in an Eastern European country. So I didn't tell them the, the city. It's, it's a real life problem in um, the ninth most polluted city in the world, Ulaanbaatar. 
in Mongolia. So they just made a documentary about how they're trying to solve the, the issue of coal burning in almost every house in the city. So I want to present the winning team. <laughs> if you come down. And they'll, yeah. So this is Caitlin from C Cambridge University and Jawan from Galway as well. And they'll just t talk you through their solution in two minutes of what they think the government can do. Um, if they were the public health officers, what they would do to reduce the air pollution, which is causing loads of childhood asthma and lung disease. Thanks. Thank you. Um, before we start, I would like to emphasize it was a bit of a surprise. And um, we don't have the expertise that a lot of people probably do have in this room, as we've even like seen today in the um, air pollution talks. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but it's an honor to be ending anyway, so thank you. So uh, uh, our first idea was um, pretty much something that, that most groups talked about as being important, and that was like understanding the cultural aspects and getting to know um, the communities and, and figuring out whether what their level of knowledge was at about the state of pollution and what they were doing and um, what the barriers were towards using cleaner fuels and um, whether they were keen to do this, and it was just like a... a a money issue, um, that kind of thing. Um, another group also had a really good idea of learning from history um, in terms of the Industrial Revolution and kind of any lessons that we could pick up from that. Um, so I think the main thing that we thought was important was like education and awareness and making this a gradual process and um, engage the community. So we had some, we tried to make some specific kind of actionable ways to do this um, in terms of um, spreading awareness of how this is affecting health. So it was really interesting um, what Martin said about this being likened to um, the problem of tobacco in terms of coal, um, because we actually one of our suggestions was printing this on like coal packets and having posters of um, showing the negative health effects and the problems like as people would be buying the um, polluting fuels. Um, and we also thought about having this in schools like in textbooks, um, radio and posters and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah. If you want to um, so alongside with the upstream um, intervention, and there another way to raise awareness um, of the, the excessive usage and um, the dependence of coals as their main source of fuel in, um, in cooking is to uh, physically show them the comparison of the normal air quality levels that we currently live in and the levels they are living in. Um, by providing mobile uh, monitors. And this is something that uh, Southeast Asian countries are doing right now, especially like in Singapore, when they have the hay season, the people would turn on their phone notifications for, um, that are coming from the, the environment department. And uh, they would send um, notifications and wait until um, school is canceled and they'll tell you, oh, uh, minimize the outdoor activity on this day and that day. Um, and that's something that people could um, learn from and they'll think, okay, so this um, a bit, like today's gonna be a difficult day to go out because the air pollution is gonna be bad. Um, also now focusing on to the downstream treatment, uh, focusing on the healthcare system uh, as it is the newborns and the infants that are susceptible to asthma, um, pneumonia. Uh, so starting from like small things such as handing out face disposable um, face masks and um, something that all or most of the groups have mentioned is to um, subsidize the costs for um, gasoline and electricity rather than um, increasing the cost for coal um, and now the adults in the room might be thinking, who's gonna pay for that? Uh, but, so we believe that in long term, it is more challenging in terms of workforce costs and uh, resources to um, pay for the treatments of these people rather than um, helping these people adopt this new lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie, and to our winners and to everybody who took part. That was really brilliant, amazing. So the very last people to uh, say goodbye and thank you are Geraldine McCrossan from Goal, Nadine Ferris France, Operations Director from the Irish Forum for Global Health, and Professor Rory Brewer of the RCSI. Um, just to, to really close things off and thank some people. Um, the first person to be thanked being Nadine herself. <laughs> I'm going.
go first. I'll be the shortest. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think there was, this has been an amazing two days in, uh, in terms of the participation. It's probably been the most participatory event that I've seen. I mean, just about everybody here was, uh, was participating, either making a presentation or responding. Uh, the, in none of the passivity that you see at so many conferences and people not falling asleep. Uh, <laughs> I know th that a lot of thank yous are due, and I'm not going to name everybody, but uh, and I hope you will. Uh, but particularly, I've seen the team that have been working around me for weeks, uh, uh, interns, volunteers, huge amount of work has gone into this, and, and I think there's huge credit due to them ab above everybody. It, it, um, I suppose from the Gold Global perspective, we'd just like to thank uh, the Irish uh, Forum for Global Health for, for being part of this great opportunity. And as um, Rory alluded to, it's, 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 it has been a really interesting and very diverse exchange of ideas. And I want to thank you for bringing those ideas here and, and discussing them and, and, and challenging us as global practitioners to look at new ways of working. And, you know, uh, to the last speaker, the students who won the thing, you know, we might bring the experience, but you bring probably the innovation. Because you're coming at this without any preconceived ideas of what's not going to work. Yeah, so it's great to see so many new global health practitioners in the room. And I, I'm going to task you with one final thing. I go to many conferences. I sit at them. I take lots of notes. I think they're great. And I go away the next day and start my day job. I want you to think for one minute of one new idea or new issue you've heard in the last day and a half that you want to further explore or take action and write it down now. There you go. And, and you could actually add it to your valuation form, Nadine says, so we know what's coming out of this. That'll be great. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm actually going to give you a minute here, guys. <laughs> Do we have a minute? Well, okay, no. <laughs> What's time? It's in your head. <laughs> okay, and uh, so I just say a final thank you, and please do take action. If you don't take action, nothing changes. Talk makes no difference. Okay, thank you very much. So we had um, over 100 participants. We had 40 presenters through this day and a half. I loved what Ian said about like probably about eight hours or, or nine hours in total. Um, we had, we had uh, 10 plenary speakers um, and we had lots of people watching online. Um, it's the first time we've actually streamed the conference online. And I know, for instance, Joe was with us today and he said, oh, I saw people speaking yesterday. So, so that's good. That worked. Um, you know, I love these conferences. What I do, what I love most is just watching the connections, watching people meet each other, helping, you know, introducing people to each other and watching people, new ideas, new collaborations, new connections, and somehow a kind of a, um, an excitement that we're in the right place, we're doing the right things, we belong, we have a, a space where we belong. I was really, really touched by um, Mike Ryan's presentation this morning. And I just wanted to share with you that I sat there and listened to him talking like real time. I had an image of him sitting there in North Kivu and the rain coming down behind him talking about reaching 300 cases yesterday of Ebola. And I, I, it was really emotional for me. I felt really, really emotional about that. And I think, you know, for me, I kind of came back to the room and thought, well, you know, we're not in North Kivu, but we're doing something. We're doing something, we're doing the best we can to, to band together as a group of, of interested people currently living in Ireland. And I think we just need to continue to, to do the best we can to support the likes of Mike and many of us who, who go out and do, do things like that. Um, in terms of the Irish Forum for Global Health, um, you know, as Geraldine says, you might go home and forget about, um, forget, you know, back to the day job. Um, the Irish Forum for Global Health is your network. It is here for you. It is only you. So please be active, as active as you can be within the network. Make sure you're signed up to the newsletter at the very minimum. It's easy to sign up on that um, on the homepage, and that way, at least you receive new updates every week. And um, there are subgroups. There's lots of opportunity for people to uh, to do new things. So please 
please be as active as, as you like. After this conference, we will make all the presentations available online and we will make all the videos, thanks to Donal up there who's been videoing for us for the last day and a half. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a firm believer in making sure that we document these things very well and that they're available to us and that we don't forget. And um, particularly loved the engagement by young people, young professionals, students, and um, that really lifts the spirit. And um, thanks to Rosie and all of the all of the people around her who made that happen. Um, many many thanks, as Rory said. Um, you know, starting with the Global Health Rights Team and and how they worked through the conference. And um, we had 23 in total, 23 volunteers, young people, volunteers, part of Global health rights and others who did all sorts of jobs and we know those little jobs those jobs of making sure that the the speakers had a glass of water when their mouth went dry that the presentation actually worked that the video came on when it did that you knew where you were going in the maze of RCSI <laughs> um, most of those volunteers are not here now because many of them are studying for an exam tomorrow which is the reality for uh, for students so we're grateful to have to have had them anybody who is in the room in terms of volunteers could you just stand up including the global Health rights people, just so we can see you again, please. Over at the back. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the conference committee. Um, as always, these things are put together by a, by a group of people who work to try and work out how are we going to fit all these submissions into the program? How are we going to make sure that we get the right people in the right place? And um, with the conference committee, would you mind just standing up, whoever's in the room from the conference committee, um, just so again we could uh, we could just see you and uh, and really thanks to them for all of the hard work in putting this this event together. Round of applause. And these guys standing. Um, and I just really want to thank my own team in the Secretariat. As, as Rory said, um, there's been five of us um, working kind of around the clock in these last, in the, these last few days. Um, especially, I want to thank so, so Evan, uh, Emmett, are you in the room as well? Emmett and Noor over there, fantastic. And I really want to thank Morgan, who today is graduating from her master's in Trinity. So she organized this whole event and then today she wasn't able to be with us. So let's give her a round of applause and she can see us online. And very, very lastly, I just want to thank RCSI. Um, I know there's a lot of thank yous for people and we get bored of them, but this is a true thank you to RCSI for hosting us in the department all the time on an ongoing basis. They provide all sorts. Rory's department provides us with a space to sit and tea and coffee when we, uh, when we get thirsty and some IT support. And then, of course, all of the, the, the venue and the opportunity to host conferences like this. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So safe home to everyone. Please fill in the evaluations because not just do we want to know what you think, we need to tell Irish Aid that these conferences are worthwhile or not. Please fill in the evaluation forms and you'll put them in the boxes on the way out. And safe home, everybody. Thank you.